And sorry about that. I don't know what what's going on. Every time I try to schedule a live, I don't even I don't even know. But we're here. Can y'all hear me? Are we ready? Are we in here? Let me know. Let me know if we're ready for tonight and y'all can hear me. Hey, we back. All right. That's thank you. Thank you all for letting me know. I don't know what goes on with YouTube when I try to do what I need to do, but we are here. How y'all doing? Welcome to another Thursday teaching. I'm super excited. Hey, Nikki. Hey, creating Shakira. Hey, Tanique. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Hey, girl. Natasha. Hey. Um, Sabrina. Hey, Janice or Janice. Hey, Luxuries of Time. Welcome. LaKendra. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Every time my mama come on here, talking about, hey, Dr. Brianna, I'm here from Chicago. <laughs> Hey, mother. <laughs> um, Y'all say hi to my mama here. Uh, Latoya, hey. Alero, how you doing? Alero, you said, do I do teachings every Thursday? So they are not every Thursday, but if I'm doing, unless it's like a pop-up, then it's whenever, you know, God leads me to do it. But generally my teachings are Thursdays. They're just not every Thursday. So do you have your notification bell on? If you do, it should alert you. Um, if you don't, that's probably why you're missing it. I don't know. You can probably try to turn your notification bell off and then turn it back on and maybe that'll help alleviate the issue. Hey, Trin from LA. Monte, hey, from Atlanta. Oh man, hey y'all. Hey, can you all do me a favor and go ahead and like this live so we can get it started in the algorithm? Y'all know that's the only thing that I ever ask you all to do is like the, like the, you know, like the video. We have an exciting, an exciting, um, we have an exciting teaching tonight. That's what I'm going to say. Um, I originally had a, a specific thing in mind that I was going to teach, but you know, uh, hey, Hamiletta, welcome from Arkansas. You know how, you know, you sit down and you do one thing and, you know, God's just kind of like, well, we're going in another direction. Um, still same concept, just different direction from what I imagined. And I, you know, I always try to go with God. Um, and so, yeah, we are, we, y'all, this teaching is about to be fire. Let me just say that. It encouraged me. When I was studying what I was studying, like studying for this message, I was convicted. I was like, well, some of this stuff, Brianna, you ain't been doing. <laughs> and so it all encompasses in managing increase. It's just a little things. And I, don't, I think we forget that uh, God does care about the little things. I am not a little things pay attention. Pay, I don't pay attention to the little things like that, but I, I probably should start because you know, it's in the little that we're able to um, pay attention or understand the big, right? And so it's been challenging for me. Uh, Trin said, I just watched a dream warning video. It was good. Thank you. I, You know what? Sometimes I feel like, man, I probably tell too much of my business, but I believe in just being honest. And I'm also operate under the um under the understanding or the idea that if i tell on me the enemy can't tell on me you know what i'm saying so i want to tell the story first before the enemy tries to tell on me so he ain't got he, he has nothing to hold over my head because i didn't probably almost told almost everything i didn't probably almost told it and so that is me testifying t telling my testimony but also walking in freedom um and so hey this is this is the life i haven't made it um, Sabrina said, love the fit breathe. Thank you. You know what? One thing that I always told God is that, you know, I, I, I suppressed my fashion sense for so long. Um, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school and becoming an academic, you know, I was trying to fit into certain modes. And so I kind of suppressed my fashion sense to kind of fit the mode of academia, even though I, you know, didn't really fit it anyway. And when God started to like bring these my my um my love for fashion back around because I did love it when I was a child and I uh, I put it down because or I used to draw and things like that and and 
because I used to be on punishment a lot. And so I used to be on punishment for the entire summer. And so I used to draw and have to do things. This is before the internet really and YouTube and all those things. But I knew that in order for me to get out of the hood, to get out of Chicago, fashion was not going to get me there. Education was going to get me out of the hood. And so I went the route of least resistance, which is the route of education. And so a few years ago, God has started like bringing my fashion sense back, probably around 2020, started bringing that that uh, desire back to look nice and to you know be fashion forward. And I really appreciate it because I felt like I was having to choose between being smart or looking nice. And I'm like, you can really... You can really just do both, right? And you can also serve in the kingdom of God and slay. And so that is, you know, that is a goal of mine forever. And so thank you so much. I'm also like a frugal shopper. So this dress, this is a dress I have on. Probably costs less than $20. I'm, I'm really frugal, y'all. All right, so Monte says, sharing your stories with us just lets us know that you are human. We appreciate your, thank you. I am human, absolutely. And this is new territory for me. So I'm learning as y'all are learning and I'm teaching, I too am learning because I am not naturally a church girl. That's not my natural thing. I'm naturally an academic. And so I'm learning a new realm as I am before you all. And so thank you for your patience um, and your welcoming um, attitude towards me i appreciate it nikki says i said on the video but thank you again for sharing your testimony and for your vulnerability in a world where folks always gatekeep is definitely needed thank you thank you so much i appreciate it and i just yeah <laughs> i think i think because i probably don't know no better i tell a lot right and so that just makes me authentic y'all i'm new to this this is something that i'm new to I've only been doing it for a few months. And so thank you so much. All right, y'all, listen, we have done all the gatekeeping. Um, if you're not on my mailing list at Brianna Whiteside, you should be. Uh, we ha I have a lot of amazing things and a lot of amazing speakers coming next month, which is actually next week. Um, and I'm super excited. So I want you to pay attention to your emails. Show some love on the blog that's on my website. Please don't leave me hanging. Um, and yeah, let's hop on in. This is what you came for. You came for me to teach you on how to manage increase. And one thing that I want you all to know is that this teaching is for anyone. If you are praying for increase and you want to have strategies for when it finally comes, this is for you. If you are in the middle of God increasing you, like you know you're starting to increase um, and you want to just make sure you have some management strategies and you want to make sure you're biblically sound in what, you know, you, he wants you to do, this is for you. If you are already increasing, right, and you just need to, you know, a refresher, you just need some encouragement, you just need some courage to continue on, this is for you. Um, and so this is for everyone, right? No matter what stage you're at, this is for you. As always, get your notes out. I want you to take notes. Don't ever take my word for anything I say. Fact check me because that is how we learn. Um, and let's hop on into it. And so we are, um, let's talk about the definition of manage, right? And so when I, when I planned out the masterclass, I really wasn't sure how I was going to teach it. Right. It was planned a month in advance. I really I didn't have a message. I wasn't sure which way we were going to go with it. But I knew that increase was on the mind of God. It was on the mind of God. How do I know this? Because he kept talking to me about increase. Right. And if he's talking to me, I know that he's not just talking to me for my sake, but he's talking to me to speak to other people. And so I know a lot of people have been prophesying and saying, you know, we're in a wealth transfer where God is going to do all of these things. And he is, right? He definitely is. But one thing that I noticed was missing, which is where I come in, is strategy. What do we do with the information that people are releasing? Like, yes, we believe. Yes, we want it. Yes, we desire it. But what do we do either as we're waiting on it what are we supposed to be doing when it comes? And what, what do we do after it comes, right? And so this is what this teaching is. And so let's talk about manage. I, I think we need to remember what manage, what we're called to do as kingdom citizens. I think we're, we need to remember that we are managers of God's things, right? We don't own nothing, 
We don't even own our own lives. Why? Because we've been bought with the price, right? We don't own our jobs. We don't own our assignments. We don't own anything. We are simply managers. This is what we are as kingdom citizens on earth. So the definition of manage means to handle or direct with a degree of skill, to exercise executive, administrative, or supervisory direction. So I tell you this definition, and I'm going to say it again. It means to handle or direct with a degree of skill, to exercise, execute, I mean, to so exercise executive, administrative, or supervisory direction. I tell you this definition because in order for you to manage anything, you have to be skillful at what you're called to manage. Now, what I'm called to manage is going to look distinctively different than what you are called to manage. But you are, you know that you are prepared to manage it because God has downloaded you with gifts and talents. Talents by way of whichever way he decided to take you to be educated, whether it be in the school system or in the world, and gifts, the natural gifts that he's given you as gifts to the world as well, right? You are a manager of these things. You don't own them. You're using them. You're managing in them in the earth realm. I tell you you're a manager because I want you to take some of that pressure off of yourself to succeed. Yes, you should succeed. Yes, you should you know, elevate in society. But once you realize that this is someone else's stuff that you're managing, some of the pressure does alleviate. In my, um, in my hyper uh, successful life, in my, in my, you know, I'm a hyper successful person where I want to achieve all the time. I used to put a lot of pressure on myself to achieve. I used to strive. And as a result of striving with a V, I would always be exhausted. I would always be unfulfilled. I would always be, you know, have anxiety and all of the things. And I'm like, why do I feel like this, right? Why am I struggling so greatly even though I'm progressing? And it was, you know, God, through the years, this wasn't something that I was open to hear for the first time, but through the years, he's, he showed me like, it's because you're trying to be God. You are trying to be me. And as you can see, trying to be me, you're going to run the risk of losing your mind. So I just, I, I, I recommend that you just stop trying to be me and just be you and do what you're supposed to do. And, you know, I did. And so y'all know that this year I decided not to set any goals for myself. It's been the greatest freedom I've ever experienced. And it's been the most uncomfortable thing I've ever experienced because and not setting any goals and taking the role of manager as opposed to owner, I am not in the driver's seat. I am in the passenger seat. I'm riding shotgun, right? I'm not stressed anymore. My cystic acne has, you know, cleared up for the most part, but it's uncomfortable because, you know, I, I'm a recovering control person, right? So I tell you the definition of manage to remind you that you are as a son or a daughter of God, you're, you're a manager. You're not an owner. You don't own nothing. Okay. I know you think you do. You don't own it. You don't own your children. You don't own anything. When you sit into the seat of the manager, that, manager, that means someone else has to take care of it. Right. Someone else has to take care of the, of the top. You're only worried about the middle stuff, right? You're the middle man. Okay, so we're going into this teaching, understanding that we are managers. Okay, we're not the owner of anything. Take the take the take the burden off today. Just take it off tonight. Okay. All right. So God trusts you to manage His affairs on earth. Let's talk about increase. The definition of increase is going to be so important because. Well, sometimes when we say increase, we mean different things, right? Increase, what I may think increase means to me is going to look di different than you, right? Than what, you, what your definition may mean. So according to definition, uh, increase means to... No, this isn't the definition. Yes, according to the definition, sorry. Increase means to become progressively greater as in size, amount, number, or intensity, to make greater and to enrich, and increase means to become progressively greater as in size, amount, number, or intensity to be made greater or to enrich. And I looked up progressively because it says to become progressively greater. And progressively means making use of or interested in new ideas, findings, and opportunities. 
making use of or interested in new ideas, findings, or opportunities. So as we're walking through these definitions, we're beginning to see that if you want to increase progressively, what do you have to do? You have to make, make use of new ideas, findings, and opportunities. Sometimes we just think increase is attached to the dollar, and it is, right? It is, but the dollar is the finish line. There is a middle ground, right, that we have to walk down in order to get to the dollar. But we have to make use of the ideas that God drops into your mind. I keep, I, I harp on that. We have to make a use of the different findings that he may be giving you about revelation, whether it be in your family, on your job, whatever you may be studying or interested in and new opportunities. Opportunities come to us every day. We just don't realize them or we don't recognize them as opportunities. We just think that they sometimes may be odd occurrences. Sometimes we're so distracted that we don't pay attention, but you have so many opportunities to increase every day. You just have to be on the lookout for them, right? And I, and I hope, hopefully I can, you know, give you some ideas as we continue to be to teach tonight. And another in, uh, definition of increase is, uh, is to enrich. Looked up enrich and it means to make rich or richer, <laughs> especially by the addition or increase of some desirable quality, attribute, or ingredient. So enrich means to make rich or richer. I'm on the rich or richer side, right? I, no, I'm not on the rich side. I'm on the richer side, right? I want the abundant because that's what Jesus said he came to give you, abundant, right? And so I'm trying to be richer, this is what a, a definition of increase, I mean, enrich means to make richer, especially by the addition or increase of some desirable quality, attribute, or ingredient. So by definition, we see that increase means to become progressively greater or richer by making use of new ideas, findings, or opportunities. Do you have ideas? Do Have you found out different things? Like, do you have new revelation? Have any opportunities presented themselves? And nine times out of 10, your opportunity is going to present itself as a problem in your life. It's not going to show up and say, hey, I'm an opportunity. Pick me. No, it's going to show up nine times out of 10 as a problem. Do you have a problem? If you have a problem in your life right now, you have an opportunity. Okay? So don't pray away your problems. You have to sit and look at this problem long enough to see what opportunity what seed of opportunity is in this problem that I am facing right now? Okay. I know that's going to take you a little bit of time. It may take you some work that may not be something you want to do, but the way that I increase as much as I do is that when a problem presents itself, I look for the opportunity in the problem. What am I, what do I learn here? How can I make this work for me? Let's go ahead and do that. So, not only did I look up the definitions of increase, but I looked up the Hebrew meaning of increase because we're coming from a spiritual perspective tonight. And so the Hebrew meaning of increase means produce, product, revenue, income, gain wisdom. I was shocked when I saw this. The Hebrew meaning of increase means produce, product, revenue, income, gain wisdom. Okay, produce by definition or produce by definition means to provide funding for, to cause to have existence or to happen. Produce by definition means, again, I'm just repeating, to provide funding for, to cause to happen or, or, or to come into existence. Product means something produced by physical or intellectual effort or output or handiwork, right? Your product. Do you have ideas that can eventually turn into products. Nine times out of 10, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. It also means revenue. That means money. <laughs> revenue, gross income returned by an investment. Ooh, investments. Are y'all investing, right? Increase measured in money that comes from labor, business, property, proceeds, or profit. Let me tell you what revenue by definition means. Increase measured in money, which comes from labor, business, property, proceeds, profit, okay? It also means the uh, another definition or Hebrew definition of increase means wisdom. And wisdom translates to skill in war. Wisdom translates to skill in war. Wisdom in administration and prudence. Skill in war. You know that you are fighting a battle almost every day, right? 
skill in war, wisdom in administration, and prudence. Prudence is what gets trips up a lot of people. Prudence, right? Do y'all know what prudence means? Prudence means good judgment and the use of resources. Prudence means good judgment and the use of resources. And that means budget, you know, the things that we don't like to do, the, the things that activate our pain sensors, meaning disciplining ourselves, budgeting, not going out to eat when you got food in a refrigerator, you know what I'm saying? Things like that, bring your lunch to work, making your coffee at home, things like that. Also looked up the Greek meaning of increase. And the Greek meaning of increase means to cause to grow, to augment, to increase, to become greater, and to grow up. What does grow mean? Grow means to develop in maturity. Grow means to develop in maturity. Today I released a blog where I talked about why we shouldn't depend on the miracle system, right? Um, and it, it's really, I think it's fascinating, right? When Holy Spirit starts to talk to me about it. But in the blog, I argue that um, the miracle system is like a lottery. It's like a lottery. You, we all put our request in to the lottery of heaven, right? To the system of heaven and say, God, we need this. We want this miracle system. We all put our request in. The system or heaven decides who gets the request. We don't have any agency over that. So what God was showing to me is that he doesn't want us super dependent on miracles. When they come, yes, we welcome them. But would you quit your job because you bought a lottery ticket? No, you wouldn't. Not in good wisdom, you would not, right? Because you don't know if you're going to have the winning ticket, right? The same with miracle system. When we are solely dependent on the miracle system, God give me, God give me, we stop working the principles in the Bible that work for us every time. So we may say, God, give me a miracle, please, and, and not do the, do the, uh, work the system in the Bible, right? That is, going to, um, that is going to ensure that we are successful every time. So in, in my blog post today, I argued that God wants us to become mature believers. He doesn't want us to be dependent on a lottery system, so to speak. He wants us to be managers of the word, managers of the earth, work the principles that will always work. Principles never change. This is why when people are wondering why people who are non-believers, they progress so much, it is because they give to charity, right? They progress because they give to the poor. That is a big biblical principle, whether you are Christian or not. The principles never change, right? So when they're giving to charity and giving to the poor, they're giving these large amounts, they're going to always be um, prosperous financially. Why is that? Because the scripture says, when you give to the poor, you lend to God. I had that burning question in my spirit because I wanted to know why aren't we progressing and, you know, we're not giving charity. Um, but that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about here. To grow also means to increase in influence, to increase in influence. And you know, influence is largely attached to, to increase. Influence is largely attached to growth and wealth and, you know, all of the things that people want. When you grow in influence, you grow in uh, money. Welcome, Fabian. Thank you for watching for the first time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so by spiritual law, increase comes from revenue associated with growing in skill, wisdom, and production, whether through labor, business, or property. Do you have any of these things going for you right now? Do you have labor going for you? Do you have business working for you? Do you have properties working for you? Because one or the other are not going to get you anywhere. So you probably need two or three of them working for you. Two or three of them. And you don't have to be an expert. You just have to know more than the next person and know enough to teach it and enough to profit from it. I don't know everything, right? But I am teaching and I am growing in business every day because I've mastered my lane. I know, I know what I know, right? And I pay for people's other information that I don't know. So do you have labor working for you? And labor could be considered your job, um, business, right? Or property. Do you have these things, any of these working for you? You need two or three of them, okay? So the first thing you should know is that the managing increase is directly attached to managing moments. That's the first thing I want you to know. Managing increase is directly attached to managing moments. In society, 
unfortunately, we've been look, taught to look for the grandiose things, right? The big things, but we ignore the small moments. But it's in managing the small moments and the detours that we ultimately get to the bigger picture, right? So in this teaching, we are going to look at Joseph's life. We're going to look at Joseph's life and we're going to study proper increase management. We will look at how he managed moments and how he managed increase because the two are interconnected. You're not going to be able to manage increase if you fail to manage the moment. If you miss the moment, you're going to miss the increase associated with the moment. One thing that comes to mind right now is that, uh, what's the prophet name that God tells to go to the brook? Elijah, Elisha, one of them, right? He tells the prophet to go to the brook because there is a raven at the book brook to feed him. That is in a moment. So but what if the prophet said, I'm not going to this brook? He would have missed the moment with the, with the food that he needed, right? So you cannot miss the, think you're going to miss the moment and still increase. No, they're, they're, they're together. Thank you, Fabian, Elijah. The two are interconnected. In order to get to the increase, you have to manage the moment. That ain't number one, though. <laughs> All right, let's hop on in. Beginning in Genesis 37, that is where Joseph's life begins. Um, we, uh, Valero says, oh my God, I just finished reading Genesis. I was like, wow, Joseph was wealthy. He was, and we are about to slow walk his life. I mean, let's go. Mm -hmm. If you haven't liked the video, please like the video. Thank you so much. All right. So the first thing I need you to understand is that number one, we have 20, 20 of these principles, 20 of these things that we're going to walk through. Number one, your increase is attached to God given dreams, visions, and destiny. Your increase is attached to God given dreams, visions, and destiny. Y'all know I've been on a kick about paying attention to y'all dreams lately, right? Your God-given increase, right? Your increase is attached to dreams, vision, and destiny. And that is in Genesis 37, 7, and also in verse 9. So at 17, um, Joseph has two dreams that he tells his brother and his father. I'm laughing at these comments. Jo at 17, Joseph has two dreams that he tells his brother and his father. Dream number one, we're going to walk through it. Dream number one um, in verse seven says, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. All right. So in verse eight, his brothers interpret the dream. Joseph never interprets the dream. I don't know if y'all ever noticed that. He never interprets the dream. In the next verse, his brothers interpret the, the dream. And they say, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? So that is the interpretation, right? That is the interpretation that we're going to see play out later on. The second dream that uh, Joseph has is in verse nine. And it says, then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Joseph doesn't interpret this dream again. It is his father who interprets the dream in verse 10. And his, his father says, will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? So ultimately, what I want you to take away from number one is that God gave Joseph a big picture in the dream, right? He gave him a big picture, but Joseph still has to walk out the steps to get to the destined end. God gives a big picture to all of us. We got the big picture. We got the vision. There are still those moments, those steps, those opportunities that we have to walk through to get to that desired end. So yes, the vision is going to be glamorous, right? But the journey will not be glamorous. And the journey threatens so many people. People stop in the middle. And I always try to encourage people, don't stop in the middle. Even if you got to crawl to the finish line, you need to get to the finish line. The journey will punk you. Yes, the journey is designed to weed out those who got it and those who fought false flag and those who fake in it, right? Don't stop in the middle, but more times than not, y'all know how God does y'all. He's going to give us the big picture and we're going to be like, yes, I signed up for the big picture, but then we have to survive the fine print. Okay. I didn't know the fine print 
for my life. I didn't know. He gave me the big picture and I'm like, ha, I'm going to be wealthy. Absolutely. I am down for this. And I've been like surviving the fine print since I said yes. I've been surviving the fine print since I said yes. So I need you all to know that God will give you the big picture and your increase is always attached to what he's shown you. It doesn't matter if the journey starts to look weird. It doesn't matter if the journey starts to look countercultural to what he showed you. He showed you the end for a reason. You have to hold on to that. So we see that God is giving Joseph this big idea, but doesn't say anything about the journey. And I've heard people start to uh, kind of preach like, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, that's number one. Your increase is attached to God-given dreams, visions, and destiny. So everything that Joseph accomplishes later on is attached to these two dreams that God gave him at 17, okay? Number two, and can someone put in a chat and help everybody out what I'm, what the num what, what number one is? Number one is your increase is attached to God-given dreams, vision, and destiny. Can y'all drop that in a chat for people who taking notes? All right, number two, proper stewardship is necessary in the increased infancy. In those beginning stages, you need to make sure that you are stewarding your increase even when it's small. Even when it is small, you have to steward it in seed form. So we see that God showed Joseph his future in a dream, right? But what if Joseph would have dismissed his dream instead of recording it, right? This is Joseph stewarding this dream in seed form. What if he didn't steward the dream? How do we know he stewarded the dream? He told people about the dream. He told his father and he told his brothers. That is you literally um, recognizing, but also acknowledging that God is speaking to you or you are having this dream. Some people just dream and like, oh, that's cute. And then heaven's like, are you going to move on it? Are you, what do you... You're going to talk about it. You're going to meditate on it. You're going to think about it. So even in talking through the dream or telling his brothers the dream, um, even in telling it is a form of stewarding it. That is what God revealed to me because you're talking through it. You're talking about it. And now as you start to tell the dream, you some, somehow you start to um, meditate on it internally, right? We'll see later on in the story that there is a line in the scripture that says, and Joseph remembered the dream. Right. So this dream, he remembers this dream. He remembers this moment later on. Right. So while we don't see Joseph writing down the dream, like doing like how we do, we, we do see his brothers telling him his dream and his father. And that is a form of recording it. So also to pay attention to your dreams. Y'all always say this. It's never going to change. Pay attention to your dreams because God may be re revealing your future. He may be revealing the future of your country to you. And he may be revealing strategy. Sometimes he has to bypass our intellect as we are um, asleep because, you know, when we're awake, we're thinking. Our intellect's like, no, nah, that can't happen because I ain't got no money for this. That can't happen because my, my daddy, he ain't do this. That can't happen because my mom ain't do this. No. God's like, I don't want you to resist this. Let me give you this in a dream. And we also know that we've seen him cut covenants with people in dreams. Solomon, you know, wisest man, he asked for wisdom in a dream. And a lot of things happen in the dream realm. And so number two is you must steward your uh, proper stewardship is necessary in the increased infancy. So in the small form. I'm not telling you who to talk to about your dream that you may have. But what you need to do is record it whether you record it on your audio device or you write it down and you need to pray into it, you're going to have to steward this thing. God is not going to just, you know, spoon feed you everything. You have to seek it out. I, like I did in that live that I did yesterday, I had to meditate on it. I had to pray about it. I had to talk to someone about it. But ultimately I went to the Holy Spirit and said, what is this? What is this that you just showed me? Right? Cause I know it came from you and we had to go through it. So you have to steward um, steward is necessary for in the, in the infancy, right? In infancy, when it's just an idea, you need to steward it well. It doesn't matter if you just think it's small. That small idea grows. What comes out of seeds? Big trees, okay? Um, I also want you to know that the concordance classifies dreams as what? The lowest grade of prophecy. 
the concordance classifies dreams as the lowest grade of prophecy. I didn't even know that until I was studying it. So you're dreaming, right? You're dreaming. This dream that God has given you is the lowest grade of prophecy. And it came to pass. It can come to pass or you can decide I'm not partnering with it and it won't come to pass. But this is God showing you his desire for you in the dream potentially or warning you not to do something in the dream. And if you do something, he may show you the consequence in the dream, right? So your dreams are prophecy. It doesn't mean, I don't care if you don't think you're prophetic or not. The concordance says that your dreams are the lowest grade of prophecy. Okay? So pay attention to that. You may not even need another prophetic word. You just need to pay attention to your dreams. Number three. Number three. Be prepared, you know, because it, others might be uncomfortable, right? And I know that that trips a lot of people up. Others, people, you start telling people your dreams or you start dreaming in front of people and then they go ghost. You got to be prepared to lose people. That's number three. In order to manage to increase well, you have to be prepared to lose people. That's hard. I know we don't want to do it. I know we don't like it, but that's part of the journey. So don't get discouraged when people don't support you. As we see with Joseph in verse eight. His brothers, it says his brothers hated him all the more because of his dreams and what he has said. In verse 10, it says his father also rebuked him. So his brothers hated him because of what he said, because of this dream God has given him. And his, his, his father also rebuked him. I looked up what rebuke mean. It means to criticize sharply. To criticize sharply, right? So be prepared for that. Be prepared for that. In verse 19, they also mock Joseph, right? In verse 19, they also mock him and they say, here comes this dreamer. So sometimes the vision that God gives us, it might cause others to be, you know, reminded about where they are not in life, right? Where they are not in life, opportunities that they may not have taken, but you can't take that personal. Um, your increase or your dream may make them feel insecure, right? But you can't take that on as personal. That's on them. And sometimes people, they stop pursuing the increase and stop managing, you know, the blessings that God gives them because they were like, I don't want them to, I don't want other people to think I, I think I'm good and I'm too good. Or I don't want other people to think that I've changed. You did change and you are becoming better, right? That is the goal. We should all pursue to become better. But sometimes that pressure of, you know, losing people, the anxiety of losing people keeps us bound, keeps us lower than who we're supposed to be. And then we're mad, like everybody ain't supposed to be great. Show me that in the scripture where it says everybody ain't supposed to be great. I want, I want book, chapter, and verse. Because just because you're great may not mean my great, God still has greatness in store for you or you wouldn't be in the world, right? So number three, be prepared to lose people. That is part of managing the increase. Do not choose. When God is increasing you, go with God. Okay? I know what it feels like to be an outcast. I know what it feels like to not fit in. I know what it feels like to walk isolated. I know what it feels like to be, you know, to be lonely. I know what it feels like to choose God in that moment. I know what that's like. But... You have to choose. Are you going for the better life, the life that God ordained for you to have before the foundations of the world? Or will you let your circle keep you small? Will you let your family keep you small? Will you? Will you? I remember, I remember, <laughs> I remember having a conversation with someone in my family um, and they were talking about, uh, another, other family members and they were, he was saying, um, yeah, you know, I, um, you know, they, they hating on me, they hated on me or whatever. And they want to keep me down, blah, blah, blah. And this is the person who's hanging with other family members that he's out his mouth saying they want to keep me down. And I'm like, why are you still hanging with them? That's family. I said, I will excommunicate myself before I let someone bring me down. I will, I will leave. I would not deal up, fool up with them. If I knew that you actively had a campaign against me 
to sabotage my life, I will stop talking to you, family and all. You're not going to do that. You're not going to do that to me. You're not going to do that. No, you're going to, you got to go with God here. If God has greatness in store for you, you cannot afford to, you know, be connected and stay connected to people who don't have your best interest in mind. You got to be prepared to lose them. And they may have been friends for one season. I know what it's like to have seasonal friends. I know what it's also like to have a season of no friends. I also know what it's like to have a season of destiny friends, right? I know what these things are like, but you have to be prepared to lose the people who are not going with you in the future. It's hard. It's not impossible. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you might cry, spit, and fart, but it's not impossible. So I want you to know that, you know, sometimes people, will, they will stop progressing in life because of who didn't support them. Everyone is not going to support your dream in, in, in small form. When it's in dream form, everyone's not going to support you. I used to struggle with that so greatly when I used to, you know, try to show up and, you know, do all the things that people would be like, I support you. I got your back. No, 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 no. And then I step out and I do it and it's in infancy form and I don't get no likes. I don't get no shares. I don't get no support. No, I know what that feels like. It feels like rejection. It feels like rejection. It hurts. It sucks. It's trash. You don't like it. But you have to decide at that point, am I committed to this process and what God said about me and showed me? Or am I committed to the applause? Because if you get hooked on the applause, this ain't even in my notes. I don't know where this is coming from. But if you get hooked on the applause, you're going to stop when you don't get it. So you might as well get used to not getting the applause in its infancy so that you won't get hooked on it, you know, when the, when the project or when the idea expands. Get used to it, okay? Don't get, don't get addicted to it. So there will be times when you don't get the support you want, but you got to determine to keep moving forward anyway. Number four, number four, your increase or future will be challenged by potential sabotagers, right? Number four, your increase or your future will be challenged by potential sabotagers. And I ask God, like, why? Why do, why, do, why do we have to be challenged, right? Why, why do we have to be challenged with potential sabotage? And he reminded me, it has to test how committed you are. We, heaven has to test how committed, your, how committed you are to your yes. Heaven has to test how committed you are to your yes. So of course, sabotages are going to come in to show you how committed you are, right? So in verse 20, bro, uh, we see this, this idea of sabotage in verse 20, and it says, Joseph brother said, come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams, right? So they didn't, do, they didn't throw him into the well, into the ground for no reason. They did it because they didn't want the dream to come to pass, right? They thought that they had the, potentially the power to stop the dream. And had Joseph stayed connected to him, they probably would have sabotaged it. And it, it probably would have been threatened. But God in his mercy separated him. Now, it don't look like God's mercy, you know, through Joseph's lineage, but it is, right? So Joseph's brothers want to kill him for no other reason than to stop his increase from coming to pass. So when you're on assignment from God, your opponent will always plant people to prevent you from achieving your destiny. And you may also be the sabotager. You might also be the sabotager of your own destiny. So you may have gotten rid of other people, right? Are you sabotaging? Are you sabotaging your increase? Are you the sabotager? Because you can by not obeying, by not managing the moments, by not doing what you know you're supposed to do, by watching TV when you know that God told you to read that book and work on that idea or work on that plan. Are you sabotaging it when you don't do it? Because you could. You could be a sabotager. I know we don't like to think that, but it is. So your increase or your future would be challenged by potential sabotagers. And the reason is to test how committed you are. Number five. Your destiny is attached to your connection with God. Your increase, I'm sorry, is attached to your connection with God. And that is in Genesis 39. Your increase is attached to your connection with God. So Joseph is sold to Potiphar. At this point, his brothers have sold him into Egypt. 
Um, he sold to Potiphar and verse two says, this is Genesis 39 verse two. It says, and the Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian math master. So I looked up prosper in the concordance and it means to advance, to succeed and to be pros uh, profitable. Prosper in the concordance, right? The spiritual definition means to advance, to succeed or to be profitable. I looked up the definition of prosper as well, and it means to succeed in an enterprise or activity, to achieve economic success or to thrive. Do y'all want to thrive, which means you want to prosper, right? And so we see here that God's connection with Joseph caused him to prosper, which is why I walked you through management in the beginning. Your connection with God is going to ensure your prosperity, right? So remember, verse two says, the Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered. That means that, that the moment he might have decided to distance himself from the Lord, he wasn't, he wasn't going to prosper. He wasn't going to prosper by God's standard because God going to get what he want one way or another. So either you're going to hear him in prosperity or you're going to hear him in the, you know, in the, in the season of non-prosperity. The choice is yours. I, I, I think you should hear him in the prosperity, right? So let's continue to walk through um, Genesis 39, verse three through six. The Bible tells us that when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From, the, from that time, he put him in charge. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that. No, I'm sorry. I messed up. Verse five. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. So now we're starting to see by Joseph being connected to God and what God, what Joseph is doing, therefore that thing is prosperous, right? Because God is committed to the prosperity of Joseph. So by proxy of Joseph being in the house of Potiphar, um, that, that, that his domain was blessed as well. And it says, um, the blessing of the Lord was on, on everything Potiphar had both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So we see here that if you maintain your close connection with God, then God's favor will shine brightly upon you. So Potiphar ultimately favored Joseph because the favor of the Lord was on Joseph. People can see God's favor on your life. Whether you realize it or not, people can sense it. It's like a spidey sense. People can sense it and they want to be attached to that, right? So as a result of God's favor on Joseph, Joseph was put in an elevated position in Potter's first house. So your favor will attract others, which will cause them to favor you um, and that will trigger another level of elevation for you, okay? So Potiphar elevated Joseph because he perceived that God was with him. People want to be associated with great people, okay? That's in life. People want to be associated with great people. That's why people take pictures of celebrity, with, with celebrities. That's why people, you know, take pictures at certain people's conferences or, you know, concerts, whatever the case may be, whatever you're interested in, because you want to be associated with someone who's known God was starting to make Joseph shine his light on Joseph. Potiphar sensed it. Potiphar sensed it. He wanted to be associated and Joseph benefited from that, you know, sense of favor. Number six, to manage increase properly, you must manage God's decrease. That is a hard one. I don't like number six. I don't like it. I don't like number six. To manage increase properly, you must manage God's decrease. That lets you know that God going to decrease you. He's going to decrease you. Um, I don't like that gospel. I don't want to ascribe to it, but we see it here that God did decrease Joseph. So by God's standard, the way up is down. And we must manage those seasons as well. Joseph is thrown into a prison because of a lie. But even in prison or in the down season, right? Because we know Potiphar's wife lied on him. But that was still orchestrated by God. And we're going to see that as we continue working through this. Uh, because of a lie, he was imprisoned. But God still prospers the work that he does 
when he's in prison. How do we know this? We're looking at verse uh, 20 through 21. It says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So we don't know what progress looks like for Joseph in a down season. You know, we don't know what that looks like for him. But we do know... Uh, that it is recorded that he still prospered. So prosperity is still possible even when you're being decreased by God. Because it says, you know, y'all know, Joseph is in prison. He's in a down season. But it says the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison. And he was made responsible for all that he was that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, right? Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So no matter if God has decreased you and you're in a season of decrease, he still expects progress from you. You don't get to sit this one out because you're in a decreased season or a wilderness season or a dry season. You don't, you, you don't get to do that. He's still expecting increase from you because he's still with you. Okay? That's hard. I don't like that gospel. I don't like it. it. It doesn't feel good to my flesh. It doesn't feel good to my mind. But we see it here in the text that God will decrease you before he increases you. He's done it in my life, y'all. I've had years of decrease. Years of taking stuff from me. Years of losing relationships. Years of crying, spitting, and farting. Years of why me, why me. Years. And I still had to do what he told me to do because he was still with me and he still uh, expected a return on his investment no matter how I felt. He still wanted an ROI. And so y'all know in the moments where you're like, Lord, comfort me, Holy Spirit, comfort me, all the things. He's like, you comfort it, but you're still going to get up. I'm still here with you. You're going to be fine. Get up and do what I told you to do. And I'm like... What you mean? It ain't fair. I don't like it. He still expects a return on investment because that even in that down season, that down season is still working for you. It doesn't feel good, but it's still working for you. No, Joseph didn't have freedom. No, he didn't have the life he wanted, but the scripture records that he still prospered even in prison, right? So in order to make it to a future moment, y'all, that you are waiting for, you must manage your present. Are you neglecting to manage your right now in hopes and dreaming of a better future? Are you neglecting the right now? You must decide to prosper because God is still with you. Just because it doesn't look like what you want doesn't mean that you can just decide to coast in this season. It doesn't. You have to work the dry season. There are still blessings available for you there. Okay? It ain't where you want to be. I know. He still expects you to prosper. He still expects you to do the work in the dry season that will ultimately, we're going to see that that's ultimately going to help Joseph sustain the position once he gets to Egypt, I mean to Pharaoh's home. So this season is working for him. He's learning what he needs to learn. You are learning what you're supposed to be, at least. Learning what you need to learn in this season. Because if you don't learn it in this season and you get to that next season and you did not learn the lesson, you run the potential of missing the moment in the next season you wait in for. Because you decided not to do the work in this season. Let's not do that, y'all. Let's not repeat a grade. Let's not do that. Number seven. Number seven, um, so we have to understand that your life has prepared you for the time released increase. You have to understand. So now I'm dealing with your mind your, and your emotions and your soul. I'm dealing with your mind, your emotions, and your soul in this uh, in number seven. So you must understand that your life has prepared you for the time released increase because increase is time released. There is a certain time by God's calendar where he calculates this person should be here by this time. Heaven is prepared to release the increase 
at the time when you're supposed to be there, right? Are you going to get there? Are you going to be ready to receive the time released blessing of increase. How do we know this? So before Joseph comes, becomes the second in command to Pharaoh, it is important to note that he was being prepared to reign throughout his life. Number one, we know this um, because Joseph managed the flock with his brothers before they sold him into slavery. And that's in Genesis 37 and two. We know that he managed the flock. So ultimately he was working in the family business. He was working in the family business at 17. Managing what? Flock. That's number one. Number two, Joseph was put in charge in a Potiphar's house and everything he owned in Genesis 39 and 4. So now he's a manager of a, someone's household. So he goes from, or in someone else's possessions. So he goes from managing animals to upgrading to managing a man's possessions and his entire household. It said Potiphar didn't worry about nothing but what he ate. Joseph control, controlled the entire estate, right? I know we don't like to think that that was an upgrade, but it was. So he went from the family business of managing animals outside in the heat, doing what shepherds do, to managing an entire estate in Potiphar's house. All Potiphar did was worry about what he had to eat. That's what your Bible say. And number three, Joseph was in charge of everyone in prison and was responsible for everything that was done there. That's Genesis 39 and 23. So now he's like a district manager. Let's think of it that way. So he goes from... Um, the family business in Genesis 37 and 2, he's elevated to uh, managing an entire estate, right? In Genesis 39 and 4, this is good to me. And then he's elevated to managing all the prison, everyone in prison and responsible for everything done there. People wasn't just concentrated in families in prison. This is the entire district. So now he's a district manager, okay? Before... He becomes a regional manager in Egypt. His entire life, everything that looked like it was working against him was an opportunity for him to learn the skills that he needed to learn for him to become a governor in Egypt. What if Joseph didn't skip all of these steps? You think he would have had the wisdom to reign? No, he wouldn't have that wisdom experience or anything. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Y'all hear this? Is, is it good? Because <laughs> when God started to show me that, I was like, oh. So he went from man, being a, a member, an employee in the family business to, to managing an entire estate, to managing an entire district. And then at the end of his, towards the end of his story, he's managing a region. Oh. All right, number eight, number eight. So that's number seven. Number eight, you can't move in your own strength. Your increase is not a tie. Is, you cannot move in your own strength. That is what God literally wanted me to tell you. You cannot move in your own strength. In order to manage increase well, when he starts to elevate you, you cannot move in your own strength. It's very tempting to do that. It's very tempting to be like, I got it, God. I got it now. I got it from here. And then you crash and burn. <laughs> you can't move in your own strength. So Genesis 40 and 8. When Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker are thrown into prison and have dreams, but no one, uh, they don't have anyone to interpret them. Joseph steps up to do the task, but announces that it is God that will do it through him. So the scripture says, verse 8 says, then Joseph said to them, do not, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. So in that moment, he interprets both of their dreams, right? But he said he's shifting the responsibility, right? Because he says, do not interpretations, what? Belong. That means to God. That means God is the owner and Joseph was only the manager of it. Manager of the information. So he casts the responsibility off of him and puts it back on God in that moment. So... Um, he interprets both of their dreams, right? And the cupbearer had a favorable dream. We know this while the baker didn't. So Joseph is shifting pressure to bring things to pass from him to God. He's shifting it from him to God 
And I think that's an, uh, an, uh, an, an important thing to do. So while he surely, while he will surely do his part, we need to see that he is clear that it is God working through him to bring it to pass. Y'all don't, don't get the big head and star still in God's glory. And like, I did this, I did this, I did this. Cause you are, you are a partner with God. You are a co-laborer. This is a group project. So you just didn't do anything. Be sure to say, oh yeah, I know God, you know, God is working through me. Give God his glory. That's all he wants. He wants his, he wants, he wants to be cited. I'm an academic. Y'all know this. And you know, in academia, you need to cite your sources when you're writing a research paper, cite your sources. There's nothing wrong with that. Give them the credit, the credit where credit is due. You want your credit. If you're working on a group project, you want your credit. God wants his credit. Just give him a credit. That's all you got to do. Give him his credit. All right, number nine. In order to manage increase, you need divine connections. You need connections. You need to, be, you need to get some connections. And God will bring them your way, as we're going to see. Um, but you have to be open to um, accepting divine connections. So number nine, you need divine connections, right? So God interpreted the cupbearer's dream to help Joseph make a divine connection. So God get, give, gave Joseph the interpretation. Joseph only said what he heard God say. So yes, the cupbearer knew who Joseph was because Joseph was everyone in the prison. We know this. Yes, Joseph interpreted his dream, but the interpretation was not so that the cupbearer I mean, but the interpretation was so that the cup bearer will help Joseph in the future. So we know, I think that the scripture says that they were in prison for a few years already before God gave them these dreams and then gave them the need to have the dreams interpreted, right? But it wasn't, God just didn't give the cup bearer dreams for a dream's sake. He gave the cup bearer the dream so that he will go to Joseph for the interpretation so that the cup bearer would be able to help Joseph out of the pit later on, right? This was all orchestrated. So in Genesis 21, the cup bearer, I mean, Joseph prophesied, you know, that the cup bearer will be restored. Um, and we see that in Genesis 21, the cupbearer was restored. Genesis 40, 21, sorry. The cupbearer was restored to his position as the chief cupbearer in the palace um, so, that he, so that he once again put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So he's like really close to Pharaoh. God didn't need the baker to get Joseph to where he was. He needed someone in close proximity to Pharaoh. The cupbearer is literally putting the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Right. So he also has access to information because when people are starting to speak and talk, he can hear the problems. So essentially, God needed someone who knew Joseph that had close proximity to Pharaoh to bring forth his plan for Joseph's life. Ultimately, I want you to understand that you can't do this alone. You can't. You were never supposed to do this alone. God will send you destiny helpers. They may not come in the way that you want them to come. They may not look the way that you want them to look. You need to be open to them because they have the, they have the potential to unlock your next season. Okay? So don't be arrogant to think that you don't need a connection. You do. We're all interconnected on this earth. Someone else may be holding the thing you need to get to your next level. I know that, I, and I know that the cupbearer was, um, I, mean, I know that Joseph perceived that the cupbearer was a destiny connection. And I know you're probably like, how you know? Did Joseph perceive that? How you know? Yes, because of verse 14. Verse 14 says that Joseph says, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Joseph discerned that this cup bearer was a destiny connection. How do I know this? He says, but when all goes well with you, because I know it will, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. He perceived that. Joseph could have left the dream interpretation at that. He could have been like, yep, I did my part. I interpret the dream. I left it alone. No, but he knew that this was a destiny helper, that this was a destiny connection. So he put, he said, I need something from you. I helped you out. Now I need something from you because I know you have access that I don't have. This was reciprocal. This is built on reciprocity. No, he right, Nikki. He didn't say if he says when 
<laughs> he says, when all goes well. All right, let's go number 10. Number 10, you must solve a problem to continue increasing. You have to solve a problem. You have to solve a problem in order to increase. Joseph made it out of prison because he had the answer to a problem that Pharaoh had, right? Joseph had, I mean, uh, Pharaoh had two troubling dreams and no one could interpret them, which prompted the cupbearer, who is Joseph's destiny helper, to remember that Joseph might have the solution. And we see this in Genesis 41, verse 12 through 13. Genesis 41, verse 12 through 13, and it says, the cupbearer says, now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and the other man in Paul. Then we move over to verse 14 and it says, Pharaoh says, Pharaoh tells, um, Pharaoh, what, I'm sorry, yeah, okay. Verse 15, I'm sorry. It says, Pharaoh says, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. So this is him talking to Joseph, right? So we can see that the only reason that Joseph made it out of the pit was because he had the wherewithal to solve a problem. And his destiny helper knew that he had the wherewithal to solve Pharaoh's problem. But Joseph also had to be, ultimately had to be willing to help someone in prison who he didn't, who, who, sorry, Joseph had to be willing to help someone in prison, even though the man in prison, the cupbearer would be free before him. I'm going to say it again. Joseph had to be willing to help the cupbearer, even though he knew the cupbearer was going to make it out of prison before him. He knew the cupbearer was going before him, but he still extended help. A lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people are like, I'm down and out, so I'm not going to help nobody. That's not what Joseph did. Joseph helped the cupbearer when they both were in prison, even though he perceived that the cupbearer was going to get out. Are you, are you mature enough to help people, even though you know that they're going to get free before you, even though you know that they're going to get to the promise before you? Are you mature enough to help them when you're in a season of hurt and pain? Are you? Because I've had to have that test a lot of times where I've literally have been in seasons of grief and pain and not getting what I want. And I see my friends get what I want and I still have to be happy for them. I still have to support them and show up. Even with the pain in my own heart for not getting what I wanted, I had to do that. Are you mature enough to do that? Or are you going to say, no, God didn't give me, so you got to figure it out. I'm still trying to figure it out, so you got to figure it out too. I can't help you because I'm trying to help myself. Are you mature? Because we see Joseph did. Joseph helped the cupbearer out even though he knew the cupbearer was going to get out first. And you got to be willing to do that. Because you don't know. You don't know what this person is going to, when your name is going to come up in that room with that person. You don't know when they're going, when God is going to remind them of you and remind them of your kindness. You don't know when it, when it's going to be your turn. You don't know. But you got to be mature enough to help even when you don't want to help. We also know that another reason that um, another problem that God, the bigger problem that God needed Joseph to solve was that he needed him to save lives in Egypt. And that's all the way in Genesis 45 and 5. And we're going to get there later. Right. Oh, no, we're going to get there right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also learned that God needed Joseph to save lives in Egypt. And that is in Genesis 45 and five. And it says, Joseph tells his brothers when they return for a second time. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. So here, Joseph, at this point in the scripture, and I moved the scripture up to, uh, to go to this point. In this point in the scripture, Joseph's brothers have come back to Egypt for the second time and he reveals himself to them and he tells them, don't be worried. But it, it is in the revelation that he gives them. It is in, in the explanation that he gives them when it says, basically, God sent him there to save lives. 
So not only did the cupbearer need to have the dream interpreted, not only did Pharaoh need to have the dream interpreted, the big picture was that God needed Joseph to save lives. That is why. Not only the lives of his brothers and father, but the lives of the rest of the tribes of Israel, the lives of the rest of the Egyptians. God needed him to save those lives. So there's always a bigger picture, okay? Number 11, increase is attached to discerning the God moment. Increase is attached to discerning the God moment. Y'all, there are God moments in all of our lives and more times than not, we do not perceive them. Therefore, we forfeit it. We forfeit them. We ignore them. We don't store it the season properly and we uh, then we be mad. Increase is attached to discerning the God moment. So Pharaoh sends for Joseph who is still in prison, right? And verse 14 tells us that when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came forth to Pharaoh. So Joseph could not step into the divine moment with destiny looking like the previous season. He couldn't. He couldn't show up looking like a prisoner because he was no longer a prisoner. He perceived that this is a destiny moment. How do I know this? Because the scripture says he shaved, changed his clothes, then went. He shaved, changed his clothes, then went. When the destiny moment shows up, you need to be prepared and suited for the moment. So essentially he showed up suitably because he discerned that he was entering a God moment. That, that moment you've been waiting for, the moment you've been praying about, when it comes, you need to show up suitably. You can't be like, um, they just gonna have to take me how I am. They just gonna have to do whatever, whatever. No, they don't have to do whatever, whatever. No, they don't have to just take you however you are. You need to show up for the, the, the thing you've been praying for, right? His connection with God throughout his life allowed him to perceive that this was the moment that he was awaiting. He didn't have to go back and pray and wait three days and fast three, three days, y'all. He was already in close communion with God. He didn't have to, he was prepared. He didn't have to say, let me, the, the opportunity presents itself, let me go pray and ask the Lord if he want to, um, if he want me to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Let me go and pray and ask the Lord if he want me to, um, you know, I need to fast three days before <laughs> to make sure I'm prepared. I need to fast three days. No, you need to be clear on, on what you're supposed to do and discern the destiny moment. Sometimes people start saying like, oh, I want to pray about it to, to, to not do any action. You, I, think we, I don't think we need that much more prayer. We need action. We need people willing to move in destiny moments. You should have been praying about it before the moment showed up. That's what you should, should be doing <laughs> before the moment shows up. You need to be praying about it when the moment ain't there. But when the moment shows up, this ain't no time for you to chicken out and be afraid and say, I got to go pray and fast. Because Pharaoh is not necessarily a believer. He wants his dream interpreted. So he don't care nothing about your God. This was the moment. This is the moment right here that, that, uh, that Joseph was praying for and he was prepared to step right into it. Number 12. You must have wisdom to manage increase. You must have wisdom to manage increase. Number 12. <laughs> I don't like when people say, let me pray about it. I don't like that. Or when people say, I'm going to pray for you. I generally pray for people right then. If I, if I ever say, I'm going to pray for you, you finna get a prayer right then on the spot. I'm not, because I'm not going to pray for you later. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to forget. Let's get you this prayer right now. You know what I'm saying? That's not something I do. I'm not going to delay this. <laughs> like, let's go ahead and get this taken care of. Let's go ahead and tap on in. All right. So number 12, you must have wisdom to manage increase. So the first act of wisdom that Joseph showcases is his dependence on God. Verse 16 reads, I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. We see he's constantly shifting that responsibility. From him to God, because he know I'm a manager. I'm just a, I'm just a manager in this thing, right? And so he says, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. 
verses 17 through 24. Pharaoh tells Joseph about the dream containing uh, the seven fat cows and the seven lean cows, and then also the second dream of the seven stalks of grain. And God gives Joseph the revelation about the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine and the reason as to why God gave Pharaoh his dream. So not only, not only did Joseph interpret the, the dreams, he tells Pharaoh the reason why he had the dream. So he says, this is what the dream means. And basically, the God gave you this dream because he has decided that this famine is going to hit the land. So it's important to remember that Joseph is not secured in abundance in this moment, though. When he's speaking to Pharaoh, he's not secured in the abundance yet. He's still in the destiny moment. The moment is still happening. He's not secured. He doesn't have a position. He's just in the moment, doing what he's supposed to do in the moment. In fact, he was just brought out of prison, but he has the wisdom of the Lord that he gained throughout his life in preparation. He has the wisdom of the Lord that he has gained throughout all the preparation, but he's still in this destiny moment. The decision has not been made concerning him in the earth, right? So remember, one of the meanings of increase was wisdom, gain wisdom. So even though Joseph was in that pit, even though he had those dry seasons, he was gaining wisdom. He was gaining wisdom and wisdom is the principal thing. <laughs> so Joseph has the wisdom that will sustain him when Egypt goes through seven years of plenty and seven years of scarcity. Number 13, increase is attached to strategy. Increase is attached to strategy. If you don't have a strategy for your increase, you ain't increasing. You don't got a strategy. Why would God trust you with the increase? And you don't, you don't have a strategy for it. You don't have a plan for it. What are we doing? I wouldn't. If you came to me and said, Brianna, I want you to invest in my business. I would say, what's your plan? Let me see your plan. Let me see your strategy. And you're like, I don't got one. You don't have an investor. I'm not giving it to you. I'm not giving it to you. No. So it's not enough to get in the room. This is what I want y'all to understand. Because people always say, you just got to get in the room. No, it's not enough for you to get in the room. You have to have a strategy to stay in the room. Because we don't want to just get in the room. We want to stay in the room. Okay? So not only did Joseph give Pharaoh the interpretation of the dream and the reason why God gave him the dream, but he also gave Pharaoh something presumably for free, that he didn't ask for. Pharaoh wanted the interpretation of the dream. Joseph gave him the interpretation. He gave him the reason, and he gave him something that he didn't ask for. He gave him the strategy. He gave him the dream interpretation. He gave him the reason behind the dream interpretation, and he gave him a strategy. So Joseph gave Pharaoh the God-given strategy for the present, and the future, and he provides the reasoning, and that's in verse 33 through 36. And Joseph tells him to do the following. He tells him to look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. He tells him to appoint commissioners over the land. He tells him to have the commissioners to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. He tells him, and he also gives him a specific direction. The number four, the specific direction is collect all the food of these good years that are coming up and store up the grain to be kept in the cities for food. And number five, he tells him this food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. So Joseph gives him five things. He tells him who to look for. He tells him what to do once he finds them. He tells him what the person should be doing, right? So they should be taking one fifth of the harvest. He tells them that they need to collect the food for this reason, right? And where to keep the food. And he tells him that the food should be held in a reserve for the country to be used in the upcoming years. That's a strategy that he gives Pharaoh. So naturally, you already know, Pharaoh's like, who else I'm going to find? Because you have solved problems. Not only did you solve the problem of the dream, you solved problems that I didn't even think about, but that you knew was coming. Now you're an asset. Now you're an asset because you have the strategy for the future that I need. 
Mm. Y'all ever have you ever heard this story taught like this? Because I hadn't. I haven't heard this story talked like this. I've heard this story talked about haters. I've heard this story talked about be careful who you tell your dreams to. I've heard this story talked about, you know, the moment when Joseph does rise and goes to a, an inflection point. I've heard all of the other things, but I've never heard anyone slow walk through this text for so that we can understand how do we increase? Because we know we're about to go into a famine in the world. We know that we're entering into a recession. The writing is on the wall. What should we be doing to secure ourselves? Well, Joseph's life has that. Joseph's life, ha Joseph's life has that. You know, people are prophesying this is going to be the we're back in the days of Joseph. You're right. We are back in the days of Joseph. That means we need to know what Joseph did to, be, to come out in the way that he did. You're absolutely right, right? All right, number 14. Let me see, let me see what y'all said in chat. Nope, not like this. This is true. Destiny helpers show up in peculiar ways. Uh, I, oh, not at all. God is intentional. Nope, okay. Mm -hmm. There are levels to this and I haven't heard anyone break it down like this. That's because I'm a, I'm a teacher. I am a teacher. The teacher. The teacher grace is going to always look different than the prophet grace than the apostle grace and the pastor grace and the evangelist grace. So when a prophet releases something, I think, and this ain't, this is just my idea. If a prophet releases a prophecy, I think it is the, it is the duty of the rest of the five fold to come in and support it. So if a prophet is saying, we're going back into the days of Joseph, a teacher like me should come in and teach you about Joseph. A pastor like me should come in and help stew. I mean, I'm not a pastor. A pastor should help come in and do what the pastor does. The evangelist should come in and do what the evangelist does. The apostle should come in and do what the apostle does. We all should come in to support the message. We all carry different functions. So I, as a teacher, we lay foundations. You cannot progress if you don't know how, if you don't have a firm foundation. You can't progress because what are you building on? Quicksand. You're gonna, it's going to keep falling, right? So it is my duty to come alongside the people who have been prophesying about this season to come help teach you, right? Because that's my grace. That's my grace. All right, number 14. Um, we all in this together. <laughs> We're all in this together. Number 14. Increase is attached to God's prophetic words about you. Increase is attached to God's prophetic words about you. So God showed Joseph in a dream when he was 17, y'all. Remember this timeline. When Joseph was 17, God showed him in a dream um, that he would rise to great prominence at 17. When Joseph shares his dream in Genesis 37 and 7, in the first part, he recalls that we were binding sheaves of grain out of the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. So a rose in a spiritual sense means to become powerful, to be established, and to be confirmed. So the first part of the dream that God gives Joseph when he's 17 says, Joseph says, when we were binding sheaves of grain out of the field, when suddenly my sheaf arose and stood upright. A rose means to become powerful, to be established, and to be confirmed. Is that not a prophetic word about where Joseph is going? Pharaoh is going to establish Joseph in Egypt. He's also going to confirm Joseph in Egypt when, he's, when he takes off his ring and he parades Joseph around on his chariot. This is confirming right? Joseph had this dream, this prophetic dream, because we know that dreams are what? The lowest level of prophecy. He has this dream of him being established and confirmed when he was 17. By definition, a rose means to move upward, to come into being or to come into attention. And we know that once Joseph became the governor of Egypt, he did come into to attention of the entire Egypt system, Egyptian system. I looked up upright in the concordance and upright means to be set over, to be stationed and to be appointed. Uh, 
um, to be set over, to be established, and to be stationed. I mean, I'm sorry, to set over, to be established, and to be appointed. So Joseph literally has this dream of these sheep arise, his sheep arising and standing upright. He's having a God has given him a prophetic impression, a prophetic dream that he would be established, that he would be confirmed. And in doing so, he would be moved upward, right? He will come into the attention of everyone and he will be set over things. He will be set over things. Let me see what this question is. Nikki says, I'm just curious and I can go reread it myself. But what was the timetable for when God gave him a vision at 17 to to when he ruled in Potiphar's house. So I I don't rem, I don't have it in my notes. But I don't think he had the dream at 17. I believe he was sold into Potiphar, Potiphar's house for a few years, like maybe I don't want to lie, but I, I kind of feel like it's maybe 2 years he was in Potiphar's house, I'm not sure. But I know that he didn't become a governor of Egypt until he was 30. So somewhere between there because he was in prison the, when the when the people in prison had the dream they were he was there for, they were there for 2 years so maybe am i lying girl go back and read it cuz i may be screwing up the timeline uh, let me get back to what i what i was doing so sorry for the brief intermission so basically in genesis 41 verse 40 through 40 i mean genesis 41 verse 40 through 41 when pharaoh says to joseph you shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders only with respect to the throne will i be greater than you i hereby put you in charge of the whole land of egypt so ultimately god is fulfilling his word to joseph that he gave him in a dream when he was 17 right to make him powerful to establish him to set him over things and to appoint him into prominence but it doesn't come to pass until joseph is 30. talk about stewarding the destiny talk about stewarding, stewarding you know what god said about you talk about a timeline 17 to 30 that's a long time. How do I know how old Joseph is? Because it tells us in Genesis 41 verse 46 that Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh the king. Okay, so Joseph is 36 when this happens. So this means that Joseph went through a 13 year process to step into the promise of God. But in order to do that, he had to store the other steps properly. Properly. Let's go to part two of the dream, the first dream, right? So, you know, the part one was um, part one that he told his brothers of the first dream was we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep rose up. Part two of that dream was while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. That does come to pass. That comes to pass in Genesis 42 and 6 and in Genesis 43 and 26. Okay. So the second part of Joseph's dream comes to pass in Genesis 42 and 6. And it says, now Joseph was the governor of the land. The person, so the, the people, sorry, I'm getting tired now. So it says, now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. So prophecy fulfilled. The, the entire prophecy is fulfilled. In Genesis 42 and 6. The second part, Genesis 43 and 26 reads, Now Joseph came home. They presented to him the gifts they had brought into his house. And they bowed down to the ground. And they bowed down to the ground. So we see that they did. the first dream does come true. It comes to pass. The prophecy does come to pass. Let's talk about dream number two. Dream number two, y'all remember, is that that's the dream when he told his father and his brothers that he saw the moon and the sun bowing down as well as the rest of his brothers bowing down to him. And it says, uh, he says that the dream is, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. That comes to pass in Genesis 46 when his father and his brothers and the other tribes of Israel, which the scripture says total 70 people relocate to Egypt. So both of the dreams do come to pass. So Joseph's increase was attached to the prophetic word that God gave him at 17 over his life. It just took some time to uh, walk it out. Nikki says, so 13 years, but we in your words be crying, spitting, and farting. <laughs> we be crying, spitting, and farting. 
when it doesn't come to pass in 24 hours. I'm guilty of cross and farting too, y'all. So. <laughs> Yeah, 13 year process for this word to come on out. I'll be crying, spinning, and farting too, so y'all ain't alone. <laughs> Number 15, let's move on through. Number 15, God's idea of family is attached to your increase. So I hope you don't think that God's just going to, you know, bless you for you. No, this is attached to your family. This is attached to generations. Who is God? God is the God of Abraham, Ica, Ica. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why do I want to call this man Ike? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's three generations. So when he's talking to Abraham, he's telling Abraham to prosper. He's also talking to Isaac and Jacob, right? So your increase is not just, oh, I want to increase so I can flex. Oh, I want to increase. So I no, it's not a, just about you. He's interested. He's increasing you. Because he wants to ensure that your children's children are wealthy too. It says a good man leaves an inheritance for who? His children's children. So when he's increasing you, he's thinking about your children's children. He's thinking about three generations in addition to your extended family. How do I know this? Well, in Genesis 41 and 45, it says, Pharaoh gave uh, Joseph the name Zephaneth Pania, which I think translates to treasury of something, treasury of whatever. Um, I didn't write that down. And he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, to be his wife. So now the increase is attached to marriage. Y'all ain't no marriage. Put that before God. Lord, I need to, you know what I'm saying? You need to increase me. So I, you know, my increase is attached to marriage. But we also see that in it's attached to family in verse 50 through 52 and it says before the years of famine came two sons were born to joseph by a senate the daughter of potiphar priest of on on joseph named his first manasseh and said it is because god has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household and then the second son he named ephraim and said it is because god has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering so we can see that god's increase for joseph is just not about him he wants to increase to continue on in lineages in your lineage right it does not profit the kingdom if you are poor it does not profit the kingdom because you cannot help the kingdom advance. I don't know where we get into this poverty gospel, but if you don't have money, you cannot help the kingdom advance. It does not benefit God to keep you for you to be poor. It also doesn't benefit this man's reputation. If we are always crying, spitting and farting about money, we are supposed to be wealthy. Go do a word search about wealth in the Bible. Go do a word search about money in the Bible. It talks a lot about those things. So money, it's also, because y'all know last week I did the teaching on commonwealths, is attached to kingdom economics. In order for the kingdom to advance, we need benefactors. In order for your family to advance, your family needs benefactors. Benefactors underwrite projects, underwrite things. You know what I'm saying? This is this is adult talk. This is grown people. This is adulting right now what I'm talking about with y'all. It is beneficial to the kingdom and your family that you are wealthy. God, want, I believe that he wants to get it to all of us, right? But if we decide not to partner with him, if we decide not to take advantage of those God destiny moments, if we decide to just say, talk about all the systemic issues, and trust me, I am aware of them. I, I teach black literature. I teach black social things. So I'm aware of everything that has been put in the place to keep black and brown people back. I'm totally aware. But your Bible says that Christ died for you to, to for you to uh, have life and that more abundantly. So either you're going to choose if you're going to play under the rules of systemic oppression and racism, or you're going to choose if you're going to play by the rules of what your God says is, a, is possible to you. He's going to let you have either one of them. Whichever one you want, he's going to let you have it. 
So if you want the hard life and the struggle and to keep repeating, I got to I gotta um, work twice as hard to give half of what they want, with half of what they got, which is a curse. If you want to keep repeating that curse over your life, go ahead. He's going to let you have it. But if you want to start reciting, I am the head and not the tail and doing the work, the actionable steps to the strategy that he's giving you to succeed, he's going to let you have that too. Choose this day. Choose this day. The scripture says, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. He has to tell you what to choose because naturally we don't know what to choose. Choose life. It's not saying that all of these things won't be a factor, but it's saying I choose not to believe that they will bind me to a lower level in society. I choose not to believe that. And therefore, because I choose not to believe it, I'm going to partner with God and do what he told me to do so that I would not be inflicted upon this systemic stuff anymore. My children would never see this. These giants, then when David killed Goliath, they didn't see Goliath no more. Your children should never see the giant that you are slaying again. They should never see it. They should never come up and taunt your, your lineage again once you, once you take care of it. But we don't want to do the hard work of taking care of it. We just want to have prayer meetings and pray. You have to work. You have to pray and work. You have to learn how to be ambidextrous. You need to learn how to pray in one hand on the one hand and work with the other hand. That's what you're going to have to do. And that ain't, that ain't in my notes. But, you know, I really just think that for too long, we have been just taught and conditioned to pray and give seed. Pray and sow into people. Pray and give money without action. Y'all see these actionable steps I'm giving you to think about, to consider? That is how you get free. You have to work the process. It's not enough for me to tell you that you need to potentially sow $100 when I haven't taught you how to steward your finances well, when I haven't taught you how to budget, when I haven't taught you how to invest, when I haven't taught you how to put your money in a high yield savings account that will, re will give you more interest on the money you have sitting there and not have it sitting in a regular bank account. It doesn't profit me to tell you these things because I haven't taught you how to fish. You will never go hungry again if I teach you how to fish instead of saying, here's the fish. Give this $100. You can't sow your way out of poverty. You have to work the process. And the process will yield you the money, the increase, which is attached to pro, pro, produce, product, business, property, and wisdom. I gave you the definitions in the beginning. Praying and fasting is not out, it's not gonna get you there. You're gonna have to work. You're gonna have to work. <sighs> Sorry, that wasn't in my notes. But so we can see. That Joseph's increase, that God's increase for Joseph is not only attached to him, but was for his family. It was for his family. Y'all know why certain families are have, the, have a lot of money? Because somebody in their lineage decided to do something about it. And so then the rest of the lineage was blessed. Y'all know why certain families are impoverished? Because someone in their family decided to do that. To, to, to not do something and then the weight fell to the next person and the next person decided not to do something and the weight, you know what I'm saying? It keeps getting passed down so someone stands up and says, it stops with me. It stops with me. God chose Joseph to stop whatever cycle that was going to happen. Uh... <laughs> I'm reading these comments, y'all are silly. God chose Joseph to stop the generational cycle. He chose him to stop by giving him that prophetic dream. He chose him to interrupt a cycle. But Joseph had to agree to do the process. In every family, there's a deliverer. Every family has a deliverer. If that deliverer decides not to do what they're supposed to do, the burden falls to the next person. 
The burden does not lift off the family. It just goes to the next in line. So if every person says, I'm not going to do it, that family is going to continue to decrease. But let one person say it stops with me and I'm going to wear the bear the weight. No, it's not fair. No, it's hard. Yes, I'm crying, spinning, and farting all the time. Yes, I'm rolling over in a cold spot all the time. Yes, I'm lonely. I don't get no Valentine's. All the things, but it stops with me. That whole lineage is going up. It's an entire inflection. I know some people like Joseph, and you know, there was an inflection point. Joseph went up. What they don't say is the entire family went up. As we're going to see to it when we get to the end of this teaching, Joseph was not the only one who went up when his brothers and his father and the rest of the tribes of Israel came. The rest of them went up because Joseph went up. It was an entire elevation of a family. What are we what are we saying here? Your your elevation is important. This is generational. Everybody goes up. I was talking to my mother recently and I said, this is one push. If we all do our part, we all coming up together. This is the season. One push. We all going up. Me and my siblings and my mother. We all going up. But it started with me. It started with me taking on the charge. Then it gave everybody else the courage to take on the charge, to answer the call. Now we all doing our part. Now we all going up. One band, one sound. What are, what are we saying here? No child left behind. No family member left behind. We all going up. Because that is what, that is the kingdom. Is that not? Is that not the kingdom? Can God trust you with that increase? Because he knew he could trust Joseph to not get revenge on his brothers. Or are you going to be like, you ain't, you ain't support me back then. They didn't want me. Now I'm hot. All on me, Mike Jones. <laughs> are you going to be that? Back then you didn't want me, now I'm how you all on me? Or are you going to say, this was the Lord's doing, let's go ahead and let's move forward from here? I'm just saying. Who? Mike Jones. <laughs> Y'all, y'all ain't finna have me out here. Give her, God take me out. All right. So God also uh, blessed Joseph to be a blessing to his father, brothers, and their children, and we see that in Genesis forty-seven. All right, number sixteen, because we only got twenty. Number sixteen. If you haven't liked this video, please go ahead and like it. This is the perfect time to like it. Number sixteen. Increase is attached to work the strategy that God gives you. It's not enough to have a strategy. You got to work the strategy. You got to work it. And we see that in Genesis 41, verse 47 through 49, increase is attached to actually working the strategy that God gives you. It ain't enough to say, God gave me a strategy. Are you going to work it? Let's, let's look at uh, verse 47 through uh, 49. And it says, during the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentiful. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping record because it was beyond measure. So here we see that Joseph actually worked the steps within the strategy that God gave for seven years, right? God didn't need to give him another strategy because this strategy was for seven years. Sometimes y'all, we think the strategy is only for a year and we're like, oh, I need a new strategy. God's like, did I tell you to get off the strategy I gave you? Or did I tell you that this strategy was for X amount of years? Oh, this, this, it ain't doing what we supposed to be doing in culture. Did I tell you to deviate from the strategy that I gave you? No. Even though in culture, because they was in seven years of plenty, it, it looked crazy for Joseph to be doing that. Just like it was crazy for Noah to build an ark talking about it was going to rain. It wasn't no rain. So Joseph is over here storing up. And they out here like, we, we, it's raining. It's 
raining money. We good. Why are you storing up? You look weird. Joseph is working this seven year plan, even though it's countercultural. Are you going to work the strategy that God gives you, even though it's countercultural? For the amount of time that he tells you to work it for. He, he only gave the strategy one time, y'all. He said for seven years, do this. Only one time. God didn't repeat himself. Joseph ran the play for seven years. The play was multidimensional. He ran it. He did what he needed to do for the seven years. He stuck to the strategy for the seven years because it was ensured to work. So we must commit to the strategy that God gives us and continue to work it until he gives us another. Don't go asking him for another strategy if you, if you haven't exhausted the current strategy he's given you. Also, don't stop prematurely. He's, Joseph has seven years. Joseph could have stopped in year five when, he, um, when the scripture says that he stopped counting it because, where is it? He stopped keeping record because it was so much. He could have stopped then, but the seven years wasn't over. He had to keep doing it. It don't matter if you think you got a whole lot. Keep doing what I told you to do, right? For seven years. We can't stop prematurely just because we may think in our own perception like, oh, it's going to be enough. No, if he said seven years, he said seven years. If he said two years, he said two years. Joseph worked that same tied strategy for seven years years and i'm pretty sure he probably wants to be like yo we can stop but no he was obedient he had seven years and he did it for seven years number 17 increase is attached to production and sales increase is attached to production and sales and this is in genesis 41 verse 56 through 57 increase is attached to production or sales in genesis 41 um, verse 56 through 57 and the scripture reads when the famine had spread over the the whole country Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians for the famine was severe throughout Egypt and all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere so if you work God's strategy then you won't have the same amount of financial pressure as the rest of the world. So while the rest of the world may be going down, Joseph is going up. And how do I know? Because the scripture says that all the world came to Egypt to what? Buy grain from Joseph. They came to buy. Joseph became a salesman. He was selling to people while a famine was going on. Meaning Joseph was now in commerce. He's in commerce now. He's in commerce. He's selling. It doesn't matter if the entire society is going into a depression or, a, you know, a recession. Joseph's like, this is a prime time. I got what they need now. I got what they need. Now I'm going to sell it to them. People, are, people may be like, oh, that's not what a man of God or a woman of God is supposed to do. Well, it just says that he opened all the storehouses and he sold grain to the Egyptians. He wasn't giving them grain away to them. He was selling because it's attached to production and sales. Remember, those are one of the definitions. Production is one of the definitions of increase. So now Joseph is in commerce. He's selling stuff. Because he listened to the strategy that God gave him for seven years prior and managed the resources during the seven years of plenty, he was now in a position to increase even more by selling in times of famine. Y'all, I know we're going, you know, the economy is taking a hit, but this is not the time for you to start uh, counting people pockets for them. You need to start selling something, something. Somebody needs something, whether it's information, whether it's a product, somebody needs something from you. This ain't the time for you to say, oh, they may not got it. Let me, um, let me go ahead and decrease my price. The price is the price. And the people who can afford it will buy it. When you have the strategy and you've worked the strategy and you've proven your worth, the price is the price. This is not the time for you to start counting people's pockets for them. I'm just saying. So just because people are broke, generally in recession, doesn't mean you have to be broke as well. My confession is a recession ain't going to come near, near to me. I'm recession proof. It ain't coming near to me. 
No, it's all good, Jaquisha. Say what you need to say. She said, bruh, <laughs> say what you need to say. Get what you need. It, for what? What are? Why are you decreasing your prices because you perceive people struggling? We don't see Joseph doing that. He he said they came to buy because why? They were they had a need. When people have a need and you can fulfill it, they are gonna pay what, what what your price is. Don't count people's pockets for them. Make your price your price. Set the price and do what you need to do. The price is the price. When people like, I haven't uh, opened up like my one-on-one -on -one cons consultations like publicly yet, but when people like email me and ask me like for hour sessions with me and I tell them the price, I'm like, here's the price. Here's the price. Cause what, what I got to offer is, you know what I'm saying? Gonna help you out, out of whatever you need to get out of. What I have to offer is gonna help you elevate whether it's financial strategies, whether it's, you know, getting your life together, whether it's a one hour coaching session. What I, when you leave me, you're going to increase if you do what I say do. Period. The price is the price. Now, whether they email me back and say, okay, I want to work with you or not, here's the price. That's the price. I'm not, I'm not lowering it. I'm not lowering it. I'm not doing that. All right. Number 18. We almost coming to the end, y'all. Number 18. We all, see, we be on here two hours strong every time. Number 18. Um... Whew. Increase is predicated on your ability to update your strategy to address new problems. I'm going to say it again. Increase is predicated on your ability to update your strategy to address new problems. So you need to update your strategy to address new problems. And how do I know that Joseph updated the strategy to address new problems? Well, let's walk through the text. God gave Joseph the initial strategy, right? But jo but because Joseph knew about management, he was able to update the original strategy to dominate. So Joseph originally collected all the food, stored it up, and sold it. Now there is no more food, right? Now there's no more food, so he has to update the strategy. And this is where we get to Genesis 47, verse 13 through 15. So this is the new problem, problem number one. So now it says, there is no food. However, in the whole region, because the famine was so severe, both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain they were buying, and he bought it to Pharaoh's palace. When the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is gone. All right, so Joseph collected all the food, sold it. Now there is no food. I mean, now there's no more money. And the people are like, we need some food. We don't have no money. Here's the updated strategy. Genesis 47, verse 16. It says, then Joseph says, then bring me your livestock, Joseph said. I will sell you food in exchange for your livestock since your money is gone. So the first issue was that there was no food. I mean, there was no, uh, they needed food. They needed to buy food. First issue. They spent all their money. Now they're saying, we don't have no money. So Joseph said, give me your resources. Give me your livestock. And then I'll give you some food. Give me your livestock. So he updated that strategy. This is ensuring. So, so we can think this of this as um, elevated strategies, right? So you know how people may want to sell you something and they have one tier for $99, $97, then the second tier is for $197, you get a little bit more, then the third tier is for like $297, and you get a little bit more. This is tiered selling. Tiered selling. Joseph sells them food. Now they ain't got no more money. He says, all right, now give me your livestock. Second tier. We see the solution in Genesis 47, verse 17 to the problem. It says, so they brought their livestock to Joseph and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, their sheep and goats, their cattle and donkeys. And he brought them through that year with food in exchange for their livestock. So not only does he have their money, they, he has their food, their, their live cattle. 
The live cattle, ultimately, exactly, Jaquisha, the blueprint. The live cattle is another come up because the cattle produces after itself. The, he got the cattle, he got the horses, he got the sheep, he got the goats, he got the donkeys. So when these animals mate, that's, gen, that's, more, that's more livestock. Joseph owns it all now. Not only do I have y'all money, y'all ain't got no money. Now I got your, uh, your cattle. <laughs> now I have the things that could have made you wealthy, but now because, but because you're hungry, now you're going to give me that too. Second tier of selling. All right, we see another problem. Second problem we see is in Genesis 47, verse 18 through 19. And it says, when that year was over, they came to him the following year and said, we cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes? We and our land as well. Buy us. Now they, 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 now they want to go into enslavement. Buy us and our land in exchange for food. That's generational wealth right there. Buy us and our land in exchange for food. And we, with, your, with our land, will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed so that we may live and not die. And that the land may not become desolate. They desperate. They willing to sell anything. They don't have no money. They don't have no livestock. Now they're selling themselves and their land. They're selling the land. They're selling grandma's house. Because they're desperate. And what does Joseph do? Because now they're asking for seed. We need seed. Give us seed, right? Um, the strategy that we find is in Genesis 47, verse 20 through 21. So Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. So now, not this is dominating. This is the domination strategy right here. Not only does Joseph have their money, not only does he have their livestock, not only does he have the land, and now he has them as labor. Now they're his employees. Now they're in bondage to him. Now they're his employees. He has just created the empire. He got the money. He got the livestock. He has the bodies. He has the land. The solution we have is in verse 47 through, I mean, verse, I mean chapter 47 and verse 23. It says, Joseph said to the people, now that I bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is the seed for you so you can plant the ground. So he said, okay, now I'm going to buy you and I bought your land, but here's the seed. I'm going to let you farm on my land now since I own it. Here's number 19. This is, these last two are, are good. Number 19, managing increase means creative Creating passive income opportunities. Managing increase means creating passive income opportunities. And we can find that in Genesis 47, verse 24. It says, but when the crop comes in, this is what Joseph talking to them now. Joseph is telling them, but when the crop comes in, now that I let you basically uh, farm on my land, when the crop comes in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The other four fifths you may keep as seeds for the fields and as food for yourselves and your household and your children. So Joseph now creates a system that will ensure that Pharaoh will not only own everything, but he will have passive income. Pharaoh will collect one fifth profit from everyone, which ensures that he stays on top. He don't even got to go work that stuff. He got one fifth coming in. That's passive income. That stuff he don't even have to touch anymore because he owns it. Once you create it and you put it out there, it keeps selling. Passive income. All those resources that are on my website, once I create it, I don't have to touch it again. That's passive income. They keep generating. We got the blueprint right here. Here is the wealth transfer blueprint right here. All right. And number 20. Managing increase is connected to generational wealth and legislation. 
managing increase is connected to generational wealth and legislation. And we can find that in Genesis 47, um, verse 26. Genesis 47, verse 26. And it says, so Joseph established it as a law concerning land in Egypt, still in force to this day, that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priest that did not become Pharaoh's. So the law that Joseph implements secured wealth for generations, not only for Pharaoh, but for those attached to Joseph, because Genesis 47 and 27 states, now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. This is generational. So not only did you know, Joseph helped create generational wealth for Pharaoh. It also trickled into Joseph's family because he was the one generating the ideas and the things like that. And as a result, is the Israelites, his brothers, his father, all the tribes of Israel, they were in Goshen, the land of prosperity. Let me look up what Goshen means. Give me one second because I, I didn't look it up. Let me see what Goshen means real quick. Goshen means da, 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 da. what does Goshen mean all right so Goshen in the Hebrew means a, a land of prosperity basically yeah it was a land of prosperity so we see, <laughs> I just walked you through 20 steps of increase, 20 steps of increase, of managing increase that you need to keep in mind, that you need to consider implementing, right? I know sometimes we may have like one or two or maybe even five on the list, but these 20, if we're believing that we're in a Joseph season, if we're believing that God wants to increase us, we need to keep all of these things in mind work the strategy, create the tiers in your business and your company, ensure that you're getting passive income, and also ensure that some of these things are attached to generational wealth. You want to know why some of these families uh, are so wealthy? Because they, run, they are kind of the force behind some of these bills that are passed in legislation. When you have money, you can influence government. You need money, y'all. We need wealth. We need the kingdom to advance, but we don't have no money. We don't have no money. And therefore, we got to be stuck praying. And God's like, stop praying to me. I've given you the strategy. The Bible literally says, I've given you the power to create wealth. You have it within you, the power to do it. You don't have to live like this if you don't want to. I decided a long time ago that poverty is not for me. I, I sensed, I don't know this for sure, but I sensed a long time ago that my last name, Whiteside, was supposed to be a prestigious last name. I sensed it a long time ago. It's a very distinct name. And I'm like, I'm going, I am going to bring back the esteem that was associated or was supposed to be associated with my last name. He says he will make my name great. And that is what I am going to partner with him to do. That's what your Bible says. I will make your name great. But in order for him to make my name great, I have to partner with him and do my part in, you know, in the earth. Right. So prophecy, I heard a prophet say this today. Prophecy is literally God's will for you. It's his intended will. But you get to decide not to play, you know, not to agree with the will. You it's really up to you. You get to decide. You will have what you say. You really get to decide if you want to prosper or if you don't. And I know sometimes we say, like, I want to prosper. I do. But then you look at your action. It's like, no, you really don't. Your actions are telling me that you're, you're lying. The spirit is telling me that you're lying, right? Your actions are like, liar, liar, pants on fire. You're lying. Because you are not willing to do the work. There's no reason why believers should be behind. No reason why. Y'all see what I just did? I just read you this. I just, I'll just slow walk you through a text. 
Hold on. Jaquisha said, the Grant Cardones of the world would have charged us 2K for a wealth class. Dr. Bree just gave us a blueprint for free. Thank you. You're welcome. Because it's in the Bible, it's free. It's right there. I All I did, I spent my time to study. I spent a few days to study this. And I just obeyed the Holy Spirit. So when God gave me the idea for managing increase, I didn't know which way we were going. But he knew that you needed to know how to manage increase. He knew that you would be on here. So he says, let me give Brianna this message. So that my people won't, what? The Bible says you, you perish for the lack of knowledge. So that my people won't keep per perishing. Here's the knowledge. Let me give Brianna this idea so that she would do it and she would help someone, you know, the watchers, the viewers get out of poverty to create wealth, to know that it is possible. I always tell you, under, under these stories are principles, are laws that once you decode them, that's the cheat code. These gurus aren't gurus. They're using principles out of your Bible. They just not calling it that. They using your Bible against you and charging you for it and not saying this is the inspired word of God. They trying to put their spin on it. I'm just doing my part. This is just my part right now. I'm just doing my part. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't benefit me to see other kingdom believers not progress. That does not benefit the kingdom. That does not benefit me. And I don't even know y'all. But it's not beneficial, and I know it's not beneficial to your family. So if I can get on here and say, okay, I'm going to spend two hours on here, and I'm going to teach this, and I'm going to laugh and kiki with y'all and, you know, break it down in the way that the Holy Spirit gives it to me, I'm going to do that because that's my part. That's my service. I serve at the pleasure of the king. That's who I serve at, the pleasure of the king. So this is just my service, and your service will look different than mine may be. But do your service to advance the kingdom. Y'all know what I'm saying? Jamie says, you, Dr. Bree, will be richly rewarded. Thank you. I received that. Taja says, this message was has definitely been oily. Thank you so much, Dr. Bree, for your yes and labor. You're welcome. Monte says, thank you for being obedient. I needed this. I plan to be wealthy and change my family's destiny. And I needed to know what to do to increase. Yes, to receive. Yes. So, y'all, can we have our edges back? <laughs> Yeah, girl, you can have your edges. You can have your edges. Nikki says, drop the cash app uh, and pass the collection play, ma'am. Uh, what's my cash app? If y'all want to give me something in the cash app, it's all good. I appreciate it. It's the book of Brianna. I just put it in the, in the chat. Uh, but yeah, man, look, it's time for us to dominate. Everybody that listens to my channel, they need to know that... I, pl I plan on dominating, so you if you listen to me, you need to dominate too. And and that's on period. That's on Mary Had a Little Lamb. You need to dominate. And I, am, I want people to dominate naturally. It does not benefit the kingdom for us to be struggling. It does not benefit the kingdom for us to be begging and having all these prayer breakfasts and prayer meetings without strategy and equipping people. Equipping people on how to prosper and not run around and shuck and buck and fall out. At the end of the day, you still gonna have the same thing you had before you got there. Nothing. That did not help you. It did not help you at all. I We have to start being responsible to show people how to progress. Y'all know what I'm saying? We want so many believers. We want so many people to become Christians and to be believers without action. It's not enough to just get saved. It's not enough. If that was enough, your Bible would have just left it at and you got saved. That's not enough. Because God's not going to do for you what you can do for yourself. He's not going to do it. I, trust me, I tried. He's not going to do it. He ain't going to do it. He's like, I gave you the, a mind. You're not a child. You should come to me as a child, but I see you as a capable, thinking human being. 
I'm not going to do it for you. It's time for you to grow up, which is why I always tell people don't depend on that miracle system because you're going to be, you're going to get your feelings hurt and you're going to be crying, sweating, and farting. Look through your Bible for principles. Look through your Bible for strategy. It's always there. Ask the Holy Spirit. What is the strategy that I need? It's right there in the text, y'all. Just take a little bit of time to think it out. It's easier to study out a strategy in the Bible than it is to go get a second job. And that's true. It's, it's, it's just honest. It's easier. It's less time consuming for you to seek a strategy in the Bible than to go work yourself into the ground, sacrifice your health and get a second job. The strategies are there, but we've conditioned to be held as captives. We've been conditioned to be held as workers, to be socialized as workers instead of saying, OK, God, how do I get free? Show me in the word. How do I get free? It's, 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 it's less time consuming. You'll have your, 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 you'll have your mind if you just spend the time in the word and look for the strategy. Don't just read the book. Don't just read it like, let me just read this. Look for the strategy. If you know somebody in the Bible was successful in whatever, in war, in battle, study it. If you know somebody was successful in money, study them. It's All I did was study Joseph's life, y'all. I didn't just pick one scripture out and scream at you. I had to go through his life and it took me days. And I was tired. I was like, Lord, how we don't ever get to the end. But I had to go through the journey to figure it out. The, the scripture says, seek the kingdom and all this righteousness and all these things will be added to you. To seek you means you have to search it out. That means you got to spend time doing it. Reading, studying, searching for the answer. God's not going to just hand you everything. He didn't just hand me this, this message. I had to work the idea. The idea came Joseph. I thought I was just going to give you some cutesy things that you need to do to manage increase. Give you some life hacks, right? From, from, from culture. When I sat down and I typed managing increase on my computer, Holy Spirit said, Joseph. And I said, that's all he said. That's all he said. He said, Joseph. And you know what happened? I had to seek Joseph's life. I had to seek his life. I had to study this man's life in a way that I never studied before. Y'all know if y'all need to know how I study, go back and listen to the master class um, from last month on how to study the Bible. It should be under the live tab. Um, I think I guess I'm going to be doing a master class a month maybe. We'll see what happens in March. But y'all know how I study the Bible. So I had to suspend everything I knew and never heard about Joseph in order to pluck out the principles for the message that God gave me to teach. Did I want to talk about Joseph? No, I wanted to be popular and talk about something else. But this is what is necessary for this season. We have to be prepared for what is about to hit the earth. Because I know y'all can sense that some, we're about to head somewhere. Y'all can sense it. Your spirit knows it. You need to be prepared for it. We need you not to have to crumble if something happens. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> hustle culture is a killer. Yes, it is. And I used to ascribe to hustle, hustle culture. I used to ascribe to that like hustle grind. You sleep when you dead. You're going to die if you, you keep adhering to that lie. Grind, grind. God never tells you to grind. He never tells you to work seven days of a week. He never tells you to, to, to not go to sleep and he never tells you that because he knows that's taking more time off your life when you do that. But what we've been conditioned to do is you got to be on your grind, got to be on your hustle. Now, there is a way that you can properly manage your uh, priorities. I don't hustle anymore. I don't grind. I go to bed. It's close to my bedtime. I go to bed at 8 o'clock. I get up around 4.30 or 5. I go work out. I, I'm living a soft girl life. That's what I'm doing. Resting in God and doing what he tells me to do. That's what I'm doing. 
I'm not hustling. I'm not on no grind and I don't care how independent I am because I know these independent anthems, these hot girl anthems are out here. Don't let them people lie to you because they booed up and they got husbands and they not single, but they up here putting out this music that's conditioning people to be a hot girl and they got a man and they in a committed relationship. Or they out here singing about being a single parent and they're married. Don't let these anthems fool y'all. Don't let these songs fool y'all. Grind culture, hustle culture will kill you. It will kill you. Quickly. And, it, and then it'll say you liked it. The grind and hustle culture will kill you and say you liked it. Because now, you, now you're moving countercultural to everything that God designed you to do. But you like that life because you signed up for it, right? That's not what God wants you to do. That's not what he wants you to do. I had to get off the grind culture, y'all. I, I, I do a lot. I'm multifaceted. I'm multidimensional. Absolutely. I get things done, but I get things done in decency and in order and in, and in the timeline of God. I get things done with the help of the Lord. Just like you saw, Joseph kept pushing that back on God. God would do this. Like I felt some anxiety try to rise up in me earlier this week. It's been a, a, a very um, demanding semester for me so far. And, you know, I, I didn't finish that. I hadn't finished the message yet. And so uh, let me block this person because I don't like foolishness like that. There we go. Um, anyway. Um, I felt some anxiety rise up because I didn't finish the, the work that I felt that I needed to finish in the timeline. And the Holy Spirit had to check me. He said, when have I ever not let you finish what you needed to do in the time you, you needed to do it? When have I ever done that to you? And, I'm, and I had to be like, never. Never. You've never done that. So he's like, work the plan that I gave you. Do the strategy for the day that I gave you. Even though I had, you know, all this other stuff coming up that I needed to do. Do the strategy that I gave you. When have you not been prepared? And that was me still having to unlearn, right? Because I'm only, what, this February, I'm only two months into the decision to not make goals for myself this year. But I've spent so many years striving to make things happen for myself. So now that I'm having to unlearn it, God has to check me and remind me, uh-uh-uh-uh. When have I not had your back? When have I not ensured that you needed to do this? When have I not given you the opportunity? And I'm like, you're right. Let me chill out. My bad. Forgot who I was talking to. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I'm telling y'all that to, know, to show you that I still have to unlearn too. I still have to unlearn too. Because when we have all these goals and we start striving, we're not depending on God. So now we're playing God. Now we're taking, trying to do him. And he's going to let you do it. And you're going to crash and burn. You're going to be crying, spitting, and farting. It's unnecessary. For what? You, God wants to take care of you. Believe me, I'm going to have a broke wrist. Lord, take care of me. I can't do nothing. I can't do nothing. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. I act like I can't do a dang on thing. You want to take care of me? Say less. What you want to do for me today? Sometimes I wake up like that. What you want to do for me today? Asking God that. So don't, 2023 is not the year to be grinding. 2023 is the year to be obedient, radically obedient and work the play. That's all you got to do. Work the strategy. You ain't got to, you ain't even got to come up to, with the strategy. Work the strategy. It's going to come to you one idea at a time, y'all. One idea at a time is going to come to you. Your generational wealth, I remember telling somebody, I remember telling somebody, this was a few years ago, I remember telling somebody, I'm going to be wealthy. This was 2021. I said, I'm going to be wealthy. And this person said, wealth takes years to create. I said, mark my words, it won't be five years. It won't be five years before I'm wealthy. Because you're not going to tell me the timeline of culture that will discredit the timeline of heaven. Mark my words. It will not take me as long as it took other people. It will not. But what if 
I would have came into agreement with like, yeah, you're right. It's going to take years for me to become wealthy. You will have what you say. Having to be like, oh, run that time back. Or extend that time. She just came into agreement with it. Extend the time. I'm not doing that. That's why you got to know. That's why you got to know. When I tell people my financial journey, y'all have heard these testimonies. It didn't take half as much time as it took other people because I ran the strategy that God gave me. Out of $10,000 worth of credit card debt in eight months, save 20K in 11, um, save 10K in 11 months, saved another 20K in 12 months, saved another 25K, no, saved another 10K in four months. Y'all see this time is starting to shorten now. If I think about it long enough, I can create the money. I can create the money. I don't have to go get a job. That's why I, I talk as boldly as I do. Yes, I am employed. Yes, I'm a college professor. But if anything is to happen, I know I can create the money. Give me time to think about it. I got passive income. I know how to read charts so I can do option trading. I know how to invest, invest in the stock market. I can be a swing trader if I decide to. I put my money in high yield savings accounts. It grows for me. What are we saying? I, that's why I'm so bold. I don't have to depend on the system or I don't have to worry about someone potentially taking my job from me. If they take my job from me, I'm still going to be okay. Because I've mastered ways to create wealth. Right? I've mastered that. I remember, because I am untenured, and generally the way that it goes in, in, in education, if you're not tenured, you're supposed to like, you can't do a lot of stuff. You can't say a lot of stuff. You can't do a lot of stuff. You know, you're not, you're supposed to just be quiet and be a laborer. That's generally how it works in academia. And um, I'm considered a junior faculty member. And um, I remember someone advising me that I should not be as vocal about some of my beliefs online as I am. Um, and the reason that they gave me for that was because that, you know, they felt that it could potentially hinder me getting tenure, right? People voting for my tenure case to approve me for tenure and saying like, you know, even though, you know, you may be qualified and you may have done everything, they could decide to vote against you. And I just had to tell this person very well, meaning your tenure is not my God. If I've done everything and y'all cheat me out of what rightfully belongs to me. God will reward me. Your tenure is not my God. So just as that's what just came to mind, that, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they said, if God deliver me, if you throw me in here, you all know what I'm saying? If y'all throw me in here, God will deliver me. And even if he does not, I'm still not going to bow. I had to take that stance. I had to take that stance. If y'all cheat me out of what is rightfully belongs to me, God will reward me openly. Mark my words. I am not afraid of you. But a lot of people are. A lot of people are. And I didn't say it maliciously, y'all. I wasn't nasty. But I had to draw a line in the sand because that's how fear works. Someone introduces fear and then it starts to, to germinate. And we take it on as our own and then we, we, we bow to it. I don't play with fear just like I don't play with poverty. I'm very radical when it comes to those things. If you don't give it to me, God is going to give it to me. It's going to get to me one way or another. And because I'm in right standing and because I'm doing what he told me to do, he has my back. I have the full backing of heaven. That's just how you got to roll, right? That's just how you got to roll. If, it, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. That's just how you got to roll. You got to roll like that. You're going to have to choose. This is the day. Choose this day who you're going to serve. What are you going to serve? Yes. No, academics don't talk about God. No, we don't. 
Not for real, unless you're like in religious studies program. A lot of them are atheists and non-believers and all the things. Okay, cool. But I'm clear that God brought me here. I'm not going to try to convert you. I don't, I'm not going to try to do that. I'm just going to let my light shine and do what I need to do. But you will not silence me. You will not do that. And I know a lot of people that have been silenced. And one way or another, whether it was their job or in their families or whatever. But that that no, we can't we gotta be bold out here, man. We have to be confident. We gotta be bold. And I mean, if if I stand for righteousness sake and I lose my job for that, God will reward me openly. He'll take care of me. And that's just how I then that's just on period. That's just how we're gonna have to do it. That's just gonna how we have to do it. I will have a table prepared in the presence of my enemy. The one in the scriptures that I love, Proverbs 31, 25, and she is clothed with dignity and strength and she lasts without fear of the future. I, what am I scared of the future for? It's already been decided. All I have to do is obey to get into it. So if my obedience and God is saying, Brianna, I want you to come on YouTube and teach my word. I want you to be confident. I want you to be, I want you to talk about me for my glory and I have, how dare I say, God, no, my job don't, we don't do this in academia, God. How dare I say that? He gonna say, her understudy is ready, give it to the understudy. You stay over there in academia. You stay over there with your gods. I'm on the side, I'm a, it's a radical stance. It's a hard stance to take, but you're gonna have to take it. You're gonna have to take it. Whose side you on? Whose side are you on? Because we're none of us, none of our jobs are secure. None of our jobs, even though they may seem like they're secure, anything can happen. None of our jobs are secure. The goal of the Fed, let me tell y'all, talk y'all something about money. The goal of the Fed right? The Federal Reserve System, right? The people who decide the money, Jerome Powell and them, their goal is to bring down inflation. You know how they're going to bring down inflation? They're trying to increase uh, unemployment. It may seem like bad for the economy, and it is, but the more people who lose, it, who lose jobs, which is why these jobs report com reports come out every month, the more people unemployed, it helps to bring infl inflation down. The Fed's job is to bring down inflation by any means necessary. That means that they're going to continue to raise interest rates that people cannot, uh, so that people cannot afford to spend and do things. Ultimately, if people can afford to spend and do things, jobs are going to start cutting people, you know, their employees. We already see layoffs happening. That is what your Fed wants. That is what the money systems of the world want in order to get inflation down. You think your job's secure? It's a trickle down effect. Tech is getting the heaviest um, hits right now. It's only a matter of time before it comes to every other sector. You think you secured your job? You're gonna have to choose God before you, 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 you go into the struggle. Because the struggle is coming on the earth. And you need to decide now whose side you're gonna be on before it gets here. And when those struggles hit, because we're not exempt. We're in the world. We may get touched by it a little bit, but it won't come affect us. That's my declaration. It ain't going to affect me like the rest of them. I'm not, I don't, I don't play by that rule. That, <laughs> that, that don't apply to me. I'm going to be like Joseph and I'm going to continue to go up when everybody else going down and crying, spending and farting. I'm not going to be crying, spending and farting. That don't apply to me. I'm recession proof. I'm doing everything that God went. Y'all know, I didn't know a recession was coming in 2019. You know what God started to impress on me? Get out of consumer debt. I didn't know. All he said was, it's time to start getting out of consumer debt. It was a nudge. It made me uncomfortable being in credit card debt. It was a nudge. I didn't know that a recession would, would hit 2022, 2023, 2024, potentially. I didn't know that. But he started nudging me years before. It's time for you to work this system. Start getting out. 
start getting out of debt. Oh, next year. Okay, now it's time for you to save uh, 10 that K. Oh, the next year. Oh, now it's time for you to save 20 K. Oh, the next year. Now it's time for you to continue saving 10 in multiples of 10. Did I know that we were going to be in this moment? No. He gave me a strategy before it came. We're not even in the worst of it yet, y'all. We're not even in the worst of it. But the strategy came in 2019, at the top of 2019. That is when the strategy started to come. Get out of debt. Because it won't, it won't help you in a few years. So you're going to have to work this plan right now. Your obedience is our reward. If we now study what you have taught in faith and action and obedience. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Auntie, I recently lost my job, but I'm not stressed. God shall fly on these. Yep. And he's going to give you the strategy to do exceedingly and abundantly. He's going to give you the strategy to progress. He's going to give you the strategy to ensure that you no longer have to depend on a job. And that's what I'm believing for you. So not only will he supply all your needs, but he's going to give you the ideas to help supply other people's needs. Because it's time for you to be a benefactor. That is what I pray over your life, that you will become a benefactor this year. Everybody watching me. Woo, y'all. I've been on here two and a half hours. <laughs> I think we good. <laughs> I think we are good. I think I have exhausted the Joseph text. Uh, Monty says, Brianna, are there times when you need to keep things God tells you to yourself? And if so, how do you know what to share and what not to share? I don't share half the things, y'all, that that God tell me. I only share a little portion of it. And so, you know, it's really like, um, it's just using discernment. I really think it's really, you know, using discernment, like some of the things I may just write down and I may think about for days and I may pray over, right? My first line of defense, defense is to go to the Lord and ask, all right, I see this, what, what, what you want me to do with this? What am I supposed to be doing with this, right? Second line of defense, and this is after maybe days of contemplation or something, I may have a conversation with a close friend of mine or my mother, right? But I've already, nine times out of 10, before I open my mouth, I've already contemplated it with God. And then if I know like, hey, I, I, I need a, another opinion, I'll talk to those people. Um, but half the stuff y'all, I don't even share with y'all. <laughs> Trust me. I know I share a lot, but there's a whole lot I don't share. Um, but yeah, just ask for discernment and ask for a, a discerning heart, a discerning mind. I'm a discerning spirit that God will lead you into, you know, what you're supposed to do. And he will. He will. Nikki says, I pray God restores you and gives you sweet rest. Like three. Thank you. Thank you, girl. Thank you for pouring out uh, all that he is giving you to us. I'm blessed by you and your message. Thank you. I'm so glad. Thank you so much. And the biggest blessing that anyone can ever do is work the strategy for your life elevate help help me advance the kingdom through your obedience in your life when you obey and when you advance the whole kingdom advance regarding divine connections everybody and their mama has an idea to make you rich how do you know who is the divine connection girl so i don't have ideas to help people make rich become rich right oh, i haven't i haven't gone to people let me say this i have not uh, invested in people that say that they can help make rich and things like that. There are seasons where I may be, um, the Holy Spirit may be revealing to me that there's something that I need to do. Like I shared a dream. I think I recorded it. It's on YouTube where I was thinking about doing something new in my business. I was just thinking about it. It wasn't concrete. It was just a thought and it was probably a God thought. Well, that night that I was thinking about it, I had a dream and a, 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 a certain guy was like, hey, you should be in my course that night before. And But I knew when I woke up that, you know, he didn't have any courses available that I was interested in. Y'all, a few hours later, he, and he announced the course that I knew that I knew I needed to be in. Right. And so I asked God for strategy. If God, uh, me and God are like this. We, we cool. We, we tight. He always lets me know either ahead of time or when it's time to go ahead and do something. So in that dream that he gave me where the guy's like, hey, you need to be in my course. That was God letting me know that this man is about to release a course and you need to be in it. 
I didn't even have to think about it. When I saw the course, I was like, this it? All right, cool. Let me go ahead and buy the course. So I would always tell you that the only way you would know is by discernment. And I don't want your, um, your focus to be like, how do I get rich? Or buy into people because they promise you that you would get rich because that is generally they plan on your emotions and it's really wrapped in sensationalism. Um, I want you to kind of focus on people who can give you strategies for life. What I just taught you was yes, management increase, but it was also a life strategy or 20 life strategies ultimately, right? Um, ask God to show you and to highlight and to connect you in those moments. Cause sometimes it may be someone stumbling across my YouTube live and that is a divine connection for them. I may have some information that they may need. They don't know it. They just stumbled across. It was just on YouTube one night, right? They just stumbled across it. I said something they needed. Bam. That was a divine connection for them. Um, but yeah. You, you, your, your relationship with God has to be click and air, click tight, air tight in order for you to know. I don't listen to a lot of people. Um, I don't, I just don't, I don't listen to a lot of people. I maybe listen to four people online at best. Nine times out of 10, I'm in study with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit needs to be your best friend. He'll tell you all the secrets you need to know. He'll tell you everything you need to know. The Holy Spirit got the answer for it. If he doesn't give you the answer, he will highlight someone to uh to give you the answer right janice says holy spirit i counsel yep and he he the cia he the cia okay <laughs> um you are my divine connection thank you remind me what we should say if we don't remember our dreams <laughs> So what I generally say, if I don't remember my our dreams, because you know that covenants are cut in dreams, um, I say, Father, if this dream was of you, I come into agreement with it. I am in full agreement. I yield myself to it. Give me the strategy to walk this thing out. But if it's not of you, I come out of agreement with any demonic covenant trying to be cut with me in the spirit realm. I come out of agreement with anything trying to attach itself to me and trying to blind me, to have me blindly uh, make a covenant or a contract in the realm of the spirit. I, I, I come out of agreement with it. I cancel the contract in the name of Jesus. Like that's all you got to do. It's just, it's a very simple thing. God is, this is of you. I'm in agreement with it. I agree with your word and what you're trying to show me. If it's not of you, I'm not in agreement with it. That's all. Um, because things are cut in your dreams. Things are cut. Covenants are cut. Contracts are signed in the spirit, in the dream realm. Cause it's the spirit realm. It's the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all. I am tired. I am tired. I've been up studying and doing academic stuff all day. And so um, I've been on here almost three hours. So I hope this has encouraged you. If you have not liked the video, please like the video. Um, share it. Listen to it again if you need to. Um, and yeah, I hope y'all have a great weekend. I can't wait. For us to talk oh next thursday i will we will be on live we're talking about decoding the spirit spiritual decoding or something of that nature we're talking about the marine kingdom um next thursday i will not be teaching um but it will be like a q and a so if you have any questions get them together because we will be on line if you you'll start you'll see the graphic go out tomorrow i think or next week uh but yeah i hope you all have a safe weekend um have a safe night. Listen to this again if you need to. And I will see you all soon. Good night. Thanks for watching.